Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m. and serves as the City's policy-making and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at www.siouxfalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting www.siouxfalls.org slash council or by calling the council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Uh, we're certainly pleased to have everybody here. Today is Tuesday, August 18th, and uh, we'll start our meeting with a roll call of your City Council. Council members Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Anderson. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Jameson. Here. Karski. Here. Kylie. Here. Sioux Falls, uh, for those of you who do not know this, uh, this man, his name is Alan Green. Uh, he and his wife Vicki, along with a number of other good stewards and leaders, uh, they put on the Lifelight uh, Festival here in, in our area. Uh, one of the largest uh, religious gatherings in, in all of America. Uh, it impacts us in so many different ways. And uh, Alan Green is going to lead us with our invocation tonight. And for that, uh, we're truly thankful, truly blessed. What we'd ask you to do is to stand uh, for uh, Alan Green's invocation. And then remain standing, please, for our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Alan, welcome back. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be here. So grateful for the rain. You know, everybody has a different perspective. Uh, you know, we're praying for rain now, no rain later. Right. Farmers are praying for rain. Some are not praying for rain. So I don't know who cancels who out. I know one thing. I know, though, that God is concerned about the welfare of the city. So we're going to pray for that tonight. And, I'm grateful to be here. So on behalf of churches and pastors and many people in this city, and I'm a resident of this city, um, we just want to come before God and pray um, for the decisions that are made tonight. So if you'll bow in prayer with me. <clears throat> God, we come before you tonight to thank you on behalf of all those that are gathered here, those that have been called to lead and guide our city. Lord, we know that these are elected officials, and yet, Lord, you have them in these places. So I want to pray for each council member tonight. We're thankful, Lord, that uh, they've given of their time to serve this city. I want to pray for the mayor and his staff. I thank you, Lord, for each person gathered here. We're thankful that we're in a country and in a city where there's freedom in government and people have an opportunity and a right to be involved in the governing process. God, we thank you for the many abundant blessings. And even in good times and in troubled times, God, we acknowledge you as a sovereign God in control of our affairs. Thank you for life itself, which we're so often reminded, even in this fine city, is very precious and very short. In the scriptures, God, you've told us to pray for, uh, as citizens for our governing authorities and those in leadership. So we pray for wisdom. I pray for wisdom in the decisions tonight. I pray, pray for peace in each of their lives. 
We pray for harmony and unity in the city and the decisions that are made, and that ultimately the decisions that are made will benefit our city and the people of this fine city. And finally, God, in the example set for us by Jesus, let us serve in humility, putting the needs of others above our own. I pray for the agenda items tonight specifically. Please give us assurance that what is voted on and how the outcome is determined is in your will. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council will now move to our uh, consent agenda. Uh, any motions, changes to our consent agenda? Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second, Rolfing. Councilors, thank you so much. Uh, yes, Councilor. Two items I'd like to draw from Please. the consent. Uh, number one, park and recreations uh, for 104, 368. Falls Park Development Overlook Cafe Erosion Control. And then economic development uh, Sioux Falls Development Foundation for 275000 Councilor, thank you very much. We'll talk about those items later. Uh, any, uh, uh, any other discussion? Very good. A roll call vote then on the other items. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Our regular agenda, Council, any changes to that? Motions? Move to approve. Carson. Second, Anderson. Got a motion to approve our uh, regular agenda for tonight's meeting. And it has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is also passed 7 to 0. Uh, folks, welcome to tonight's meeting. Glad you're here. I, this is an opportunity for you to engage the city council on really any topic uh, that you believe is important involving our, our city. Uh, all we'd ask, just come forward, introduce yourself to the people, uh, to our town, and if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less, uh, the council will certainly appreciate that. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Bruce Daniels in Sioux Falls. While Jim gets set up, uh, I wanted to uh, say that on today's 100 Eyes show with uh, the Argus leader that uh, Stu Whitney and his guests were discussing and joking about the EC siding, the event center siding. And we're getting close to a deadline that I thought was imposed for a one-year warranty program to make sure everything was up and up on the event center. And, and uh, we still don't have an answer and we're getting close to that deadline. So just would like to have some kind of an answer one of these days. And, and Mr. Mayor, I wanted to thank you for handling a situation last week at the meeting, the city council meeting, when, when you handed the gavel over to Kenny Anderson and, and you asked a very important question that a lot of us in the audience were asking and it should have received a very simple answer. And thank you for, for getting that very simple answer. It took two and a half minutes to do it, but we got the answer. And then, so then we have some issues on, uh, on the uh, dealing with that uh, concern from last week with the vacation of the, the street Duluth. And uh, so what we'd like to know in here is, is uh, how does a neighborhood uh, actually know if they're the target for something like this. You know, we've been going through and, and looking at all of the items that are, that are out there. There's, there's four dots currently on the city's 2035 plan. And so we want to know what the target is. And go ahead, Jim. And so what, what I've done here is, sorry about the confusion here, but We've got a series of colors on here. If you notice the target that I just had on there, plus this, we have all these colors, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. I'm kind of new to the shape places dis discussion and all of these things that are involved. And so I'm 
doing a crash course in learning on this, and as people ask me questions, I'm passing it on. So go ahead, Jim, on the next one. We, yeah, that's fine. And so on this, last week, Mike Cooper was up, and he presented this, this green dot. And we started asking, what's so important about the, the green dots? And if you notice on the, the green dot, it's showing up in a big form in this area. And you guys made a vote last week based on a green dot. Our question is, why, are this, why is there a green dot in this area? If we go to the next map, this is out of the, the 2035 plan that was done, published in 2009. Where at 41st in Minnesota and where else are there going to be dots that we don't know anything about? You know, when were the decisions made about these dots? Go ahead, Jim, on the next one. So we started looking at the big green dot that I showed you a few moments ago that Mike Cooper gave us, and why isn't there a dot on 41st and, Min and Minnesota? You know, we're, we've got a situation here where these people in that neighborhood didn't know they were living under a green dot. And now a decision was made last week about a vacation on that street, and they didn't know that they were part of that decision process. That's not fair to the neighbors and to the neighborhoods. So our question goes back to, you know, when did the city council vote on dots? And if there was some kind of a decision made about dots, shouldn't the public have been involved in it? There's, there, how many more dots are missing off of the maps? I was just at a meeting uh, today on the, on the uh, transportation meeting, on all the plans for the new streets and so on that go out to 2040. And I was looking at that and I didn't see any green and red dots or anything else on those maps. So we're doing some highway planning, but we don't have the neighborhoods, neighborhoods involved in knowing that they're, all of a sudden their street or their neighborhood is gonna be eaten up by some kind of a commercial development. So there are several developments in newer parts of town, and they're going to be very surprised as we start seeing these neighborhoods eaten up by commercial development. So we're putting in new $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 houses, and we're going to start seeing these people being upset. And so we're just asking is how big these dots are going to be, 200, 500 feet, and how do we get an answer as to the dots? So thank you very much. Mr. Anderson, thank you as well. Appreciate it. If folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Well, okay, very good. Please come forward, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me, Robert Colby. We had a conversation here some time ago about uh, naming of roadways and streets, et cetera. And this is some of the things that uh, we have within the state of South Dakota that are already named. The Blue Star Memorial Highway, Historic Highway 77, American Legion Memorial Highway, Herb Hubert H. Humphrey Historic Highway, Laura Ingalls Wilder Historic Highway, George S. Mickelson Memorial Highway, Eisenhower Interstate System, Can-Am Highway, Veterans Memorial Highway, Richard Knipe Memorial Highway, Pearl Harbor Memorial Highway, Veterans of Foreign Wars Memorial Highway, POWMIA Memorial Highway, Korean War Veteran Memorial Highway, Vietnam Veteran Memorial Highway, Veterans Victory Memorial Highway, U.S. Marine Corps Memorial Highway, Cecil E. Harris Captain, U.S. Navy Memorial Highway, Chad Meckles, Memorial Highway, Crazy Horse Memorial Highway, Goodson Borgland Memorial Highway, James Scotty Phillip Highway, Purple Heart Memorial Highway, Warrior Trail. And there's two more pages of things that are named after people, places, and things in South Dakota that most of us have never heard of. If you want something that's gonna be a memorial, it's something that should be used daily and seen daily. Now, I would give you a literary suggestion as I change direction here, that you might, in the uh, interest of reading, 
pick up a book by George Orwell and read Animal Farm. It gives you a good history of how our congressional delegation acts and behaves. The best quote from that is, as the hogs rule the roost, all animals are equal. It's just some of us are more equal. I hear public comment is, has a chance of being moved to the end of the meeting. And uh, my father was a very uneducated man because his father kept him out of high school because of the dirty 30s. He was rather straightforward, unlike myself. And if that were to, trans to take place, to move the public comment to another point in the meeting, his words would have been two. One of them would have been chicken. He was a Republican. <clears throat> There's another word after chicken. He was a Republican, never had much good to say about any Democrats, but he did like Harry Truman for two reasons. One is a little sign that was on Truman's desk. The buck stops here. And the other one, Truman actually said it, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Ms. Colby, thank you very much. Uh, folks, I failed to say, if there's an item uh, on the agenda later on, uh, just save your comments for, for then. But if there's uh, any other topic you want to talk about, um, just come forward. Well, thank you, folks. We appreciate that. Let's move on to item number 28. Or no, I, I apologize. Let's move on to Councilor Anderson, Jr. Had two items he wanted to cover from the consent agenda. Uh, the first one is park and rec. Uh, involving a Falls Park Overlook, uh, and it's $104,368. Uh, Councilor? Uh, wait for Director Kearney here. Thank you, Don. You bet. Could you just give us a brief overview of what's happening there and how this will enhance that area? You bet. Uh, we do have some erosion that's uh, taking place uh, what I would characterize as the on the west side of the Overlook Cafe. Uh, we've got some riprap that's in there now, but the soil that uh, is holding up that riprap is starting to wash away, uh, not only adjacent to the um, uh, west side of the cafe foundation, but also uh, the uh, southernmost uh, bridge abutment that goes across the river. And so what this will do is it'll allow a contractor to go in there, uh, regrade that area so we have positive drainage, and then they'll actually put rip back, riprap back over the top of that area to preserve and, and uh, keep the erosion from happening again. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Let's... Council, would anybody want to make a motion on this? Move to approve or combine. Second, Anderson. Councilors, thank you very much. Uh, if no further discussion, roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. And that has passed 7 to 0. Uh, Councilor Anderson Jr. also wanted to talk about an item for $275,000 involving, I think it was economic development. It was for economic development. If we could have the Development Foundation director come up, please. Mr. Barr, would you mind uh, introducing yourself to the people of our town, please? Sure. I'm Slater Barr. I'm president of the Sioux Falls Development Foundation. Thank you. Slater, the reason I asked you up is I've had a lot of people ask me what the Development Foundation does for Sioux Falls. Um, and I thought it'd be a good time for you just to give us a brief overview, maybe some examples. <laughs> sure. So the Development Foundation is principally concerned with the economy of Sioux Falls. And we try to improve the economy in a variety of ways. That includes promotion of the community, that includes um, research and trying to develop strategies to attract workers, to develop a workforce, to meet the demands of the jobs that are in the community, um, and to work with existing industries that are already here to grow and expand. And a big part of that is the uh, providing um, and creating industrial business parks so that there's a place that's appropriately zoned with infrastructure and utilities and is ready to go so that when a company is ready to grow and expand or to relocate to our community, there's a place for them. 
but it's kind of a, it's a whole gamut of issues related to trying to improve the economy. I guess the most recent example on the uh, industrial park side would be Foundation Park with a recent announcement um, that you were all were familiar with. But it's a host of things. I mean, um, a perfect example is this weekend we had two reporters from the Huffington Post that were in the community, and that was a result of the work of the Development Foundation in Ford Sioux Falls to generate lifestyle stories about what a great place we have to live and to work and um, to spread that word across the United States so that when people are considering a location for careers and to place their businesses, that there's that positive uh, stories that are out there. So there's just a whole gamut of activities. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to say something real quick on this. When Slater was selected as the Development Foundation Director, I believe uh, Councilman Jamison and I were young councilmen at that time. And uh, uh, I just want to say it was a fantastic selection getting you away from Georgia and everything to come up here. You just like to hear my accent. <laughs> yeah. uh, but He's still there. <laughs> thank you for the work you do, sir. Thank you. Councilor, would you like to make a motion to approve this item? So moved, sir. Is there a second? Second. Arsene. There is a second. Uh, roll call, please. Council members Rothing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. We'll now move on to item number 28, please. New 2015 retail wine license for Fernson Brewing Company, LLC, Fernson Brewing Company, to be operated at 1400 East Rober Drive. CUP not required, pending final inspections per health and building services. 29 is new 2015-16 retail malt beverage license for Fernson Brewing Company, LLC, Fernson Brewing Company, to be operated at 1400 East Rober Drive. CUP not required, pending final inspections per health and building services. 30 is a new 2015 retail wine license for Ramcota Companies, Inc., Aerostay Hotel, to be operated at 2821 North J.C. Lane, CUP not required. 31, new 2015-16 retail malt beverage license for Ramcota Companies, Inc., Aerostay Hotel, to be operated at 2821 North J.C. Lane, CUP not required. 32, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Catering America, Inc., Chef Dominique's Catering, to be operated at Bank Midwest, 225 South Minnesota Avenue for a private social on August 26, 2015. And 33, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Catering America, Inc., Chef Dominique's Catering, to be operated at Vance Thompson Vision, 3101 West 57th Street for customer appreciation on September 14, 2015. Thank you, Lori. Good evening, Jamie. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Items 28 and 29 are for Fernson Brewing Company. It's a new brewing company that would like to have a tasting room, and these two allow um, licenses, if approved, would allow that. Um, items 30 and 31 are for the new hotel located at the airport, and items 32 and 33 are special one day. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jamie, thank you. Council? Move to approve Erickson. Second. Second roll. Councilors, thank you so much. Uh, if there's no discussion, a roll call, please. Council members Rothing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Those items have passed seven to zero. Item 34. Deferred from the meeting of 811.15, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Section 30.022, ordinances, resolutions, motions, and other documents. Councilor, did anybody want to speak to this item? I know Councilor Staggers had talked about it. Yes, Councilor Erickson. Um, well, I'll make a motion and then I'll Thank you. preface it. Move to approve. Second, Anderson. Councilor uh, Anderson has made a motion to approve this item. Second by Councilor Anderson, Jr. And I do have an amendment. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, just hang on, Councilor. Yep. Is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this item before I let the council proceed? Very good. Councilor Erickson. Uh, I have a, an amendment. Um, I worked with Councilor Staggers. Well, I'll make my motion, I guess, and then say my comments. Sorry, I don't mean to be out of out of order. Uh, my motion is to amend replacing increase in property taxes with increase in property tax revenue pursuant to SDCL 10-13-35. Second, Karski. Uh, Councilor Erickson has made a motion to amend this item, seconded by Councilor Karski. Councilor Erickson. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, after the um, discussion we had last week, um, and there were some concerns uh, with our uh, attorney staff, um, and we delayed it a week, and so I worked with Councillor Staggers as well as um, 
the Secretary of Revenue, uh, Mr. Gerlach, and his um, staff there, my former friends and colleagues there. And so I reached out to them, told them the intent of the, resol or the ordinance, um, what it was hoping to accomplish, and they had agreed that there was um, possibly a, a little confusion that could take place. Um, so upon um, some collaboration with them, um, they did make this suggestion, and um, it does clarify that we are, in fact, abiding by state law, which is our first responsibility, um, and it still meets the need that Councillor Staggers had intended to do with just creating transparency and, and making sure that the, the uh, citizens have proper notification. Councillors, uh, very good. Uh, a yes, Councillor. Um, while I agree with somewhat with what you're saying, you've just pointed out what I said last week, uh, Councillor Erickson, and that is that this is really a state problem uh, and we should wait for them to do it correctly, uh, however they want to do it and if they want to do it and then, uh, and then make the change at that time. Uh, they're giving you, a, this is a guess what the best wording would be and I would suggest that we wait until the state takes care of this and, and vote on it at that time. Councilor Rolfing, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah Councilor, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to go to Councilor Karski and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mayor. I think this is a very good amendment, and I know Christine went to the uh, Secretary of Revenue and did it properly or got it the way it probably fits well into our ordinance. I'm going to encourage everybody to vote at least yes for the amendment and then let the... Um, the main motion stand on its own as amended and vote separately on that, but I would encourage you to vote yes for the amendment. A roll call vote, please. On the amendment. Okay, so your motion, I, I have a motion made by Erickson and Anderson and then a, an amendment made by Erickson, but I don't have a second on the amendment. Second. Yes, you do, uh, Councilor Karski. Okay. And uh, this motion to amend by replacing increase in property taxes with increase in property tax revenue pursuant to SDCL 10-13-35. A roll call vote, please. Okay. Council members, Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. We now have an amended main motion. Uh, any further discussion, Councillor Erickson? I just wanted to respond uh, to Councillor Ralphing in regards to having the state um, fix um, a potential issue. There's not an issue with um, the state law. It's our city ordinance. That's where uh, the hang-up that Councillor Stagers had um, with just making sure the notification was done pursuant to SDL 10, 30, 13, 35, um, the former, the way it was written before, could confuse it with an opt-out. And so this is just, we increase uh, the property taxes at the um, inflation. That's what the state law allows us to do each year. And so his intent was just to say that this is pursuant to that. It doesn't um, change whether or not we're increasing, decreasing. It doesn't change anything with that. It just... Um, kind of guides along with what the state law is already allowing us to happen. So I just encourage you to vote yes on this, please. Councilor Mark. You know, it's it's rare that I agree with Councilor Staggers, but this is one where I kind of lean that direction. You, you can laugh, it's true. But um, my, my other side of that, though, is that why do we not list everything then? I mean, if we're going to say there's property taxes in this ordinance, then there should be in the title that we're having sales taxes, that we're collecting fees, that we're, you put the whole ordinance in the title, it doesn't change what the ordinance does. And so, I mean, I understand what he's saying, and that's why I say I agree, but I think let's be realistic about this. We understand fully this is state law and that we're allowed to do it. We just take the bare, bare minimum, we take the CPI for, for that inflationary increase, but let's be real, we could put everything in there and not everybody's gonna be happy yet, so just know. Irrevocable, please. Council members, Ralphing? No. Anderson? <sighs> yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? No. Kylie? Yes. Uh, that is passed five to two. Item 35. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations $365,500 for parks and recreation. 
Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Tracy Turback with the Finance Office. This is first reading of a supplemental appropriation ordinance that would supplement the current budget in the amount of $365,500. The, uh, the funds, uh, if approved, would uh, appropriate dollars for the uh, outdoor splash pad to add that feature to the indoor aquatics facility project. This increase uh, would, uh, would increase the authorized funding for the project by that $365,500 to a total of $24.1 million. And uh, the funding source for this uh, $365,500 would come from unobligated, uh, the unobligated balance in the capital fund remaining from 2014. I thought I would uh, uh, provide just a, a brief recap of some of the discussions that we have had. Uh, this has been kind of an ongoing conversation for the last six months or so. Um, in fact, going back to February 10th at an informational meeting, we did have a discussion with the council about the outdoor splash pad and the fact that it would be uh, bid under the project as an alternate item. So in other words, it was not included as part of the base bid for the project and was not included or expected to be uh, covered in that $23.7 million budget. The estimated cost reported at that time was $450,000 to $500,000. And uh, uh, the, there was a, a strong support, I believe, at that informational meeting voiced by the uh, uh, members of the council to fund that uh, uh, splash pad in the final project build out. It was just a matter of whether or not we could fund it within the existing appropriation or whether it would take additional dollars to do that. And there were some, some at that time that uh, supported, uh, strongly supported adding dollars into the budget. And that evening then uh, the, at the council meeting on, the February, uh, on February 10th, um, the council took up that discussion again and in conjunction with another action was, uh, uh, there was a, a move to uh, amend the budget by adding $500,000 to the, uh, the project budget and uh, supplement the splash pad into the project at that time. That amendment for $500,000 uh, did, did not succeed. It failed on a three to five vote. Uh, however, those I know that, that did uh, oppose the motion at that time did voice support for funding the splash pad. And so we've kept that discussion going since that time and uh, been keeping you updated from time to time as more information uh, was learned. In, uh, in April, when we gave our regular update to the council on the, uh, the project uh, at your four o'clock informational on the 28th, um, it was reported that the splash pad bid had been received. At that point, the project had proceeded to have some of the, some of the work put out for bid. And in fact, the, the bid for that alternate was $365,500 once we added in the uh, associated cost with that. Um, at that point, of course, we had more construction uh, packages that uh, were yet to be bid, and uh, we expected at that time the final bids on, on all the packages to be uh, completed sometime in June. And so in April then, the recommendation uh, from, from me and, and the team was to continue to wait and see how the rest of the bids came in on the project uh, with the idea uh, that if there, if there were sufficient savings in those bid packages that perhaps we could fund the splash pad out of the existing $23.7 million budget without appropriating additional dollars. And so we, we continued the discussion then until our next update, which was last month, uh, July 28th. And uh, one other thing I should mention, that we, we did talk about in April that there, there was time because we were, we were still bidding out packages, uh, but the, we were informed that a decision on the splash pad didn't really need to be made from a, a project standpoint and keeping the project on time until late summer, early fall. So in July, uh, again, at a, at a project update, uh, we again reported to you the, the cost of the splash pad that had been bid. The, uh, and reported that all at that point, all the uh, construction packages had been put out for bid, but there were not sufficient savings to fund the splash pad uh, within the, the $23.7 million budget that we hadn't obtained sufficient savings to cover that $365,000 item. And so at that meeting, um, we indicated that unless there was strong opposition expressed that day that we would return to you in the near future with a supplemental appropriation. And so that brings us to tonight. 
Uh, we are here on the 18th of August with this first reading. And uh, with that, uh, I will stand down and see what questions uh, you folks do have. Uh, Don Kearney with the Parks Department is also here, as is uh, Kendra Simmons, my project manager on the project. And we also have representatives from uh, Tegra, our owner's rep, uh, TSP, the project architect, and Sioux Falls Construction. So we've assembled uh, anyone we can think of that might be able to answer questions that you folks might come up with tonight. I can't guarantee you they'll all be back here on the 1st of September. So if you've got questions for any of them, I would en encourage you to, to uh, bring them up tonight if you can. Thank you. Tracy, thanks for the history lesson on this. Great job. Appreciate it. Uh, counselors. Yes, Councilor Karski. Tracy, before, I'm sorry, catch you real quick. Before you sit down, um, is this then added, this 365.5 added to the um, maximum price with the construction manager at risk? I, I believe that's procedurally what would happen then. If you appropriated the dollars, then that would be, a, a, in effect, a change order to the project uh, contract that we have with Sioux Falls Construction. Okay, and to date, has the, have the contingencies or the contracts come in so that we're still meeting the dollar amounts that we had allocated for this project? The, the project is within budget. Uh, the, there aren't sufficient dollars within the existing budget to prudently add this large of an alternate or additional item by change order without some additional funds, at least in my opinion. Okay, thank you. And if I could, one more. Please, Councilor. Mr. Carney. Don? Don, I know we were all provided with um, pictures of what the splash pad will look like from up above. Um, first of all, I, I, I truly am advocating for this splash pad. When we started the outdoor, the indoor pool, I was one of the first to push for an outdoor component right. to, the, to this pool. And I'm happy to see that we're progressing with including it. When will the public have access to the pictures, or are there, do they have access to the pictures? Well, uh, thank you, Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, these, the pictures we shared with you today are just hot off the press from TSP, and so we can certainly put those out on the website and have those available. Uh, so we certainly can do that. Please, thank you. You bet. Good suggestion, Car uh, Councilor Karski, thank you. Council would, uh, yes, Councilor Jameson. Don, thank you. Uh, the uh, pictures you say of the drawings are hot off the press. They were used, are they the same drawings though that were from the beginning? They're they slightly modified based on, uh, you know, the original concepts that we used in all of our educational presentations. Many of the features are very similar, but some of the things that we've done in final design is uh, we've moved the actual splash pad away from the glass adjacent to the building, just primarily just to avoid splash up, up on the building. <laughs> Uh, you know, in the final design, the pool contractor, uh, you know, and the, and the designer, Councilman Hunsaker, has made some modifications and tweaks to actually, you know, the actual physical construction of it when they put it out for bid. And so it is a little different than uh, what was there, but largely the concepts are, are very, very similar. It's not like it's gotten smaller or uh, eliminated features. It's just moved a little bit. Yeah, for... yeah we reconfigured it a little bit, uh, again, primarily just to avoid you know, they, they splash a lot. Obviously, that's the intent of the, the unit itself. And so we have glass adjacent on the building in that location. So we just slid it out and bumped it out a little bit further. And if I could, the, uh, Don, thanks for, Tracy, for bringing everybody here uh, tonight. You know, we ch I challenged you maybe a little bit last time about telling us, help me tell the public on why we're spending so much and why it's gone over budget and that the staff is doing their job and hasn't wasted it or hasn't done something wrong. Help me explain that to the public. And I think you brought people here or, or, or to help maybe explain that process. And, and I read your email and I was just trying to read it again while you were, there wasn't enough time, but do I understand it right that we're only about $11,000 off of the bidding process? And, and in, in order for you to maintain a healthy contingency fund, you would rather not deplete your hold contingency fund, you want to get some new money. Could you just explain that a little bit better? Yeah, uh, Tegra's been, done a really good job of helping us to identify at what points along the, um, the construction progress 
do you want to maintain a certain level of contingency? And so they've advised us on how much contingency they feel like we should have in the project. You know, we've got some walls up, but we've got a long ways to go on the project itself. And so their recommendation uh, is to, to maintain a contingency. And I think Tracy had mentioned it at our last uh, uh, presentation to the council is that if we, if we funded this out of our contingency, it would only leave us with about $200,000 for contingency on a, on a very large project. So uh, Tegra is not recommending that we, we burn down that contingency it's so early in the project. Right. And then I, I think Tony Wiseman from Sioux Falls Construction, uh, he's been doing all the bidding on the project and would be a great person to explain how they're trying to get the very best value uh, for our taxpayer dollar. Councilor Connor. Thank you. I, num number one, I was one of the individuals uh, back in February that voted against this. And the only reason I voted against it at that time, because I didn't think it had been thoroughly vetted publicly. And we're doing that now. And, and I'm very much in favor of this now. And I'd just like to, maybe I misheard Councillor Jamison, but I thought I'd heard explain to the public why we're over budget. And I just want to make it clear we are not over budget Thank with you. the plans as they are laid out now. What we're doing here tonight is appropriating additional funds for plans that go beyond the current set of plans. Is that not correct? Yes, and, and as Tracy mentioned, uh, you know, early on back in February, we mentioned that it wasn't part of the base bid. And typically on projects, we do have alternates that we award based on av available dollars, depending on the bidding climate. If we get really good bids, we can you know, advance additional work. And so this is very much a similar situation. And we are currently within our budget. That's our, correct. Thank you. Councilor Rolfing. Yes, Don, uh, along that line, are there potentials for saving more money as we go along here? Uh, you know, there. I think the, the potential is that uh, it will depend on how much contingency we use as we go forward. You know, if everything goes smoothly, if that's your, if that's your question. Contingency, yeah, what kind of contingencies? Well, and I don't know. I'm sure there's there's a reason for that. I, my, my, my thinking is... Okay. We've got, you said about 400,000 in contingent funds? Uh, we have about 600,000 in contingency. Okay. What I want to make sure that we don't do is um, spend that $600,000, assuming nothing else needs to be changed, okay. decide that we're going to put in, um, as I just said, uh, gold plated um, uh, toilet fixtures in there, just to, just to do that, that we come back and use that money first and foremost to pay for this um, <coughs> spray park. Would that make sense? Kendra, would you- Boss uh, is behind yeah. you. Yeah, I'll let Kendra. Kendra <laughs> maybe explain to the council uh, the event center process and, and how that is relevant to the- uh, Kendra the Simmons, ma, I'm back. So yes, Council Rolfing in general, we don't want that to happen. But the reason why project management exists is that, yes, we have $600,000 in contingency today. Construction needs a decision on things like a splash pad for timing reasons now. Would, would we say, if we knew how the project would end by in, eight, you know, in a year from now, yes, let's, let's use the contingency dollars for the splash pad, sure. But we can't say that. And there's a decision point today that Sioux Falls Construction is asking us, do we want the splash pad in the project? Now, I can't tell you um, at the end of the project, we're going to manage the project to stay on budget and take alternates as we go. And so at the end, you could, you could look at the project and say, you took all these alternates that could have totaled the splash pad, but it's all based on timing. And that's how we manage the project with contingency. No, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying if we all, if we do this tonight, and, and put the $365,000 toward the splash pad, I would like to see that that $600,000 is spent by necessity only, not for real big updates or upgrades. Sure. That kind of thing that I know we were able to do at the, at the uh, Premier Center, which was fantastic. I like, and I, I don't want to cut the quality out there or anything like that. Right. I'm just saying, you know, this is an important thing, and if we've got that $600,000, let's use it for the spray park if we can. If we can't, then, they, then they, the money will be there. But right. it can be the, the... And what we always have to remember, at least in my world for project management, is contingency is used to keep the project on budget. It's a win if you use, can use it for upgrades later. 
So the event center is a great example about we were using contingency to maintain the $117 million budget. And because of our contracting process and because of Tegra and the consultants we had on board, we were able to save money to do with upgrades. I am still in the camp, and I think Tracy Turback is too, that right now our contingency is used to keep the project on budget. And if I can, Councilor Rolfing, uh, we're actually not going to approve anything tonight other than you folks would consider whether you'd want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, September 1st in regards to this item. Would you mind making that motion? No. And is there a second? Then there's a second. Uh, now let's continue the discussion. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Uh, Don. Taking a look at this drawing that you provided for us, it only shows a, a portion of the actual center. <clears throat> and then uh, where, where is this going to be located uh, in reference to like the main entrance? Uh, the main entrance as you look at it would be off to the, <coughs> to the right side of the page. Uh, the small pool uh, that you see there on the right, uh, that is the therapy pool. And then uh, the main entrance would just be on the right <coughs> side of that therapy pool. So it'll just be off to like the left of the main entrance then, and that, that'll be the fenced in area. Correct, yep. Okay, thank you. You bet. Councilor. Don, I think it's only fair if, uh, if it's been so described as a public hearing or a vetting of the uh, splash pad area that you provide a picture of the splash pad area. We have it on our emails and we're looking at it but we're not vetting it. But oh, you want it up on the screen? Point of order, if Mr. You have Mayor, it, it's it, a first reading only. This isn't the public hearing. This is not the public hearing. This if is just it's going to be reading. described as a, a vetting, we should have a picture of the plat splash area. I think it would only be reasonable. In most cases, we would have a description. And all I'm asking is I'm sure there's a picture. Don, do you have a picture of the item? Jim's got it. Yep. But, but to describe this as a public hearing, it's not. I, I understand. I just, okay. Thank you both. I appreciate it. Um, would you mind just thank you there's a picture um, Councilor Jameson is there anything else you want soda would be good <coughs> thank you soda <coughs> I'll let you get that yourself <laughs> but, well council there's been a motion to set a date of uh, hearing and second reading for September 1 and uh, we've had some good discussion already uh, and we've also got a picture now so uh let's vote on this uh Rokovo, please okay council members rolfing yes anderson yes. erickson yes erpenbach yes jameson yes karski yes kylie yes that is passed seven to zero thank you council item 36. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property south of West 85th Street and east of South Meredith Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District, petition number 3010-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Good evening. Diane DeCoyer with Planning. Um, the item before you, as Lori described, um, the applicant for this is Lamar Van Heuven. It's located south of West 85th Street and east of South Meredith Avenue. The size of the parcel is 2.9 acres, and the purpose is to construct six twin homes. I can answer any questions you might have. Diane, thank you. Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Urban Buck. Thank you, Councilor. What we're doing, uh, Councils, uh, we're setting a data hearing and second reading for Tuesday, September 1st. Thank you both for that. Appreciate it. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing, yes. Anderson, yes. Erickson, yes. Urban Buck, yes. Jameson, yes. Karski, yes. Kylie, yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 37. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property south of West 85th Street and east of South Tallgrass Avenue from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District to the RD2 Twin Town Home Residential Suburban District, petition number 3029-2015 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. The applicant for this project is Brady Hyde. It is located south of West 85th Street and east of South Tallgrass Avenue. The size of the parcel is 7.4 acres and the purpose is to develop four plex units. And I can answer any questions you have. 
Diane, thank you so much. Council? Move to set the second reading for Tuesday, September 1st, 2015. Second, second Rolfing. Councilor, thank you. Uh, I'm going to give the second to Councilor Rolfing. Uh, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 38. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 5201 South Sycamore Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban and RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban Districts to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban, RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban and RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density Districts, petition number 3072-2015 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. This item actually is withdrawn. I think you were notified, the clerk's office was notified of that. Lori, do we need a motion to withdraw this yes, item? Yes, please. We do. I'll make that motion to Thank withdraw. you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilors. Appreciate that. There's been a motion to withdraw this item. It has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item number 39. First reading An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 3520 South Gateway Lane from the C3 Commercial Community District to the O Office District, petition number 3104 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. The applicant for this is Jean Pesca. It is located west of I-29 and south of South Gateway Boulevard. The size of the parcel is 1.97 acres, and the purpose is to remodel the interior of the building for the Volunteers of America main office and training facility. I can answer any questions you have. Diane, thank you. Move to set the second reading for Tuesday, September 1st. Second. Councilor Anderson, Jr., thank you. Uh, Councilor Rolfing, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 40. First reading An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property south of West 82nd Street and west of future South Beale Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District. Petition number 3105, 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. The applicant for this um, is Palace Construction. It is located south of West 82nd Street and west of the future South Beale Avenue. The size of the parcel is 11.1 .1 acres. The purpose is to construct apartment townhome type buildings ranging in size from 6 to 16 units per building. I can answer any questions you have. Thanks, Diane. Yes, Councilor Jameson. Thank you. The, uh, I had a call on this property uh, asking about the road improvements exiting the, uh, this, this area. Will they go on to 85th? 85th is gravel. Uh, will that street be improved by the time that they finish their project, or will they all be exiting to the north on Beale? Um, I don't have that detailed information on the roads right now. We don't, um, we don't get that kind of information from engineering at this point of a rezone. Diane, when would you expect that you'd get that, just to help the council and the public understand? I can get some preliminary information for the second reading, if you'd like. Thanks, Diane. Thanks. I Councilor? If, I wonder if, uh, Chad, do you have some information on that that you could share with us? Uh, Chad Hebe with the Engineering Div Division of Public Works. We are um, looking at uh, at least paving a portion of 85th Street but I'll work with Diane so that uh, at the second reading we can give you a more uh, point as to how far uh, west we'll be going. Chad, thank you, Councilors. Thank you. Would anybody want to? Oh, yes. Uh, at the second reading for Tuesday, September 1st. Councilor Anderson, Jr., thank you. Second. Perfect. Councilor Mbach, thank you for the second. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 41. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 3801 West Technology Drive from the I 1 Light Industrial District to the RA3 Apartment Residential High Density District, petition number 3106 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. 
The applicant here is Erica Beck with Lloyd Companies. It is located west of Louise Avenue and south and east of Technology Circle. The size of the parcel is 1.4 acres. The purpose is to construct a multifamily high density apartment building. This is a single building, um, four stories and 39 units on it. And I can answer any questions you have. Diane, thank you. Council, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, September 1st uh, for this item? So moved. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Kiley has made that motion. Second by Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kiley? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 42. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at the northwest corner of West 22nd Street and South T. Ellis Road from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban, RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban, RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban, and O Office Districts, petition number 3107 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. The applicant for this is <laughs> Kelly Nielsen with Nielsen Construction. Um, it's located northwest corner of West 22nd Street and South T. Ellis Road. Size of the parcel is 17.8 acres. The purpose is for future residential and office building. <coughs> Diane, thank you. Excuse me. Yes, Councilor Jameson. If I could, sorry, uh, Diane, on the, on the 22nd Street, uh, is there a an access point off of that road into the uh, commercial corner? Um, we are not showing the exhibit provided by the applicant. Doesn't indicate that to us at this point. I'm sorry, you say it does? It does not. As you can see from the exhibit that's on the screen right there. There probably will be one, but we don't have that information from the applicant. Okay, thanks. Move to set the second reading for September 1st, Tuesday. Second, Karski. Thank you, Councilor Karski. Appreciate that. Uh, <coughs> roll call, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 43. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the 2013 <coughs> Shape Places Zoning Ordinance of the Code of Ordinances of the City for Off Premise Billboard Sign Opportunities. Planning Commission recommends approval. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Shauna Goldhammer with the City Planning and Zoning Office. Uh, here to present as the first reading the billboard ordinance. We did have a study group, met five times. Uh, Councilor Kiley was the chair of that committee, and this is the result of those good folks' hard work and efforts in to amend our ordinances to accommodate billboards differently primarily pr providing 10 opportunity districts within the city of Sioux Falls where those billboards can be located. Very good. Uh, Councilor Kylie, did you have any comments, sir? Um, just basically, I just wanted to recognize the individuals that served on the study group. Uh, Sean Irvin, who was here uh, just a moment ago and has since left, uh, Greg Neitzer uh, is here. Greg, if you'd just wave to the group. And then uh, Dana uh, Loski is in the back of the room as well. And Kim James, I don't think Kim is here. But then obviously, Shauna played a major role in this, and Jeff Schmidt, and, and Director Mike, Mike Cooper, and Assistant Attorney uh, Danny Brown uh, did as well, too. And we had uh, signed company reps that were uh, present at every meeting. Um, and uh, the first meeting was general information. And there was no opportunity for public input, but in the remaining four, anybody that attended that had a desire to include any additional information had that opportunity to do so. Uh, and that included citizens uh, that were also uh, there to express their concerns about the billboards. Councilor Carley, thank you very much for that uh, synopsis. Councilor Erickson. Just a question either for uh, Councilor Kylie or Shauna. Um, as in regards to the discussion, and I should have, I, I apologize, I didn't watch it, and I probably need to go back and watch the Planning Commission. What was the discussion with a 5-3 vote? What was, what was the hang-up maybe with some of that? Uh, the Planning Commission uh, had some issues with the language regarding uh, future 
amendments, two opportunities, and a five foot, 500 foot spacing from sensitive uses, cemeteries, and some other uh, things that we wanted to protect. Um, they were not understanding that <clears throat> in the current ordinance that we have, uh, 500 spacing would not be reasonable because there's a lot of signs currently that are within 500 feet, but we did want to accommodate future expansion of opportunity districts and include that 500 feet in the future. So I think there was some confusion in why not the 500 feet now versus why only in the future. Thank you. Shauna, maybe, and Councilor Erickson, thank you. So the three that voted against this, uh, could you please try to give a, a, a flavor then? What did they want? I, I'm not real sure what they wanted. I think that they were concerned with the confusion about okay. how the 500 feet wouldn't apply with this ordinance and that it would only apply in the future. Very good, Councilor Erickson, thanks for bringing that up. Sufficient. Appreciate it. Councilor Kiley, any, any thoughts on that? I would just like to add to that. I agree with Shauna that I think uh, their concern was that um, we, we basically have a different standard for the existing opportunity districts because those are billboards that have been established prior to this point in time. Uh, and the, any expansion of the opportunity dis, uh, districts would then have to adhere to the 500 foot setback from sensitive uses, which I might add, there was right now, um, there's zero feet setback from sensitive uses. Uh, we had looked at uh, Rochester, Minnesota, that uh, they had 250 feet, and then we set it back further to 500 feet. So this would apply, and, and I do believe, again, I agree with Shauna that if, because uh, when we analyze 250 feet, uh, I believe 44% of the existing billboards would then be non-conforming. And if we uh, then did that for 500 feet, it would be nearly 90% of the existing billboards would non be non-conforming. And I do believe with uh, Shauna's assessment that that would be viewed as not reasonable. And Lori, I'm embarrassed. Do we have a motion already to set the data hearing? We don't. For approval. Councilor yeah, Anderson, Jr., thank you. Second Rolfing. Councilor Rolfing, thank you. Um, a roll call vote, please, on the uh, the hearing date. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0, item 44. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Title 15, Land Usage, Chapter 160, Zoning, Subchapters, Definitions, and Form UT1, Basic Utilities Pertaining to Basic Utilities and Tower Utilities. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, again, Shauna Goldhammer. This is another zoning ordinance amendment to accommodate a new type of telecommunication equipment called uh, microcells. And there's some examples of what a microcell looks like. And this is an amendment to the zoning ordinance to accommodate and have a standard for this type of technology. Shauna, thank you. Council, would anybody want to set a data hearing and second reading for Tuesday, September 1? So move, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. Councilor, thank you so much. Can yes, Councilor. Uh, one Councilor question, Rolfing. Shauna or Vernon in the back. I believe when I've been visiting with uh, different people about this, the, the towers can go above 30 feet, like the 35 or 37 feet, and all the information says 30. And so I'm wondering just how tall these things can be or will be. Ms. Vernon, these are, would you like to speak to that? Councilor Brown, would you mind speaking to that item, He's sir? more familiar with the technology than I am, so I'll turn the mic over to Vernon Brown. Councilor Brown, welcome. Uh, Councilor uh, Rolfing had a question, sir, about uh, the height. Mayor, Councilor, it's good to be in before you this evening. Councilor Rolfing, these are 35 feet tall. Okay. And just That's for the I public, think. this will improve the data network uh, for smartphones. Thank you. Oh, Councilor, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? <clears throat> Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. And that is passed 7 to 0, item 45. 
A resolution approving the release of a permanent 10-foot utility easement located in part of Lot 2, Q Place, second addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota, and the easement is located in vacated North Chapel Hill Road, located in part of the west one half of vacated North Chapel Hill Road, adjacent to Lot 2, Q Place, second addition to the City of Sioux Falls, Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Good evening. Uh, thanks for reading that, Lori. Good job, Chad. Thank God I didn't have to. Um, these easements are, are east of Cleveland Avenue, uh, south of 6th Street, and north of 10th Street, and are located on property that is part of the Hills of Rest Memorial Park. Uh, on the map, uh, the area in blue are easements that were created when this right-of-way was vacated in 2002. The area in yellow is the portion of that easement that is being requested to be released tonight. This is just a, an up, a closer view of that area. <coughs> this is a view of that vacated right away, uh, looking southwest from 6th Street. This is the same view uh, of the vacated right away. Now we're looking northeast. And this is from the end of Chapel Hills Road, looking north. And right where you're looking, just north of that pavement, is where. Uh, the property owner plans to build a, I'll call it a maintenance shed uh, in this area. The portion of the easement does not contain utilities and engineering recommends approval. Chad, thank you very much. Folks, anybody in the audience, did you want to speak to this item at all? Very good. Uh, Council? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. And a motion to approve this item. Seconded uh, as well. Uh, a roll call, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Pass 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 46. A resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota to establish a pre annexation agreement with the petitioners for Foundation Park. Michael. Good evening. Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. Uh, some time ago, the City Council approved a memorandum of understanding involving the Sioux Falls Development Foundation. Uh, pertaining to a parcel of land to be known as Foundation Park. Uh, the site is north of Interstate 90 and west of Interstate 29, consisting of just over 800 acres of land area. Within that memorandum, it identified that the next step in the process would be to establish a pre-annexation agreement. And so tonight we're asking the council to consider approval of this resolution that outlines uh, that process. The purpose of a pre-annexation agreement is generally uh, specifying the conditions under which property then may be annexed um, in the next stage of development. So in this case, the Sioux Falls Development Foundation is proposing to purchase property shown uh, within this exhibit for the future Foundation Park development. The property is currently outside the city limits and uh, would be annexed as part of our normal development process. So under the terms of the pre-annexation agreement, uh, we have identified what the impacts would be in terms of the requirements, not only for the city, but also for the property owner, which in this case would be the development foundation. Uh, it will stipulate cost and potential assessments, um, as well as any other future uh, understanding that would appear in the annexation resolution agreement that will come to you at a later date. Um, as part of this pre-annexation agreement, it also specifies that there'll be no cost for city services to the property until after the development, the property is annexed and connected to our city infrastructure. Uh, the property includes a number of parcels and the legal description is included with, uh, with the resolution. But I just want to quickly go through the, the components of the agreement. And Mike Gray with Community Development was instrumental in helping us put this information together along with Public Works and the Attorney's Office and others, as well as the Development Foundation. Uh, with water services, the expectation is that the city would install a 16-inch water transmission line along Marion Road next year. Uh, approximately 3,200 lineal feet, and the estimated cost to do that is about $800,000, and that's shown on the exhibit that we have up on the screen. 
Uh, the development foundation or the property owner in the future upon annexation would also be responsible for all other water main infrastructure and related uh, water distribution system platting fees. Under sanitary sewer service, we divided it up into a stage one and stage two. Stage one would be the initial service to the site uh, from our existing sanitary sewer system. Uh, we would be extending a transmission line, a trunk sewer, I should say, from what we call Basin 13, which is at 60th Street North up to 72nd Street North. Um, and that would also include an installation of a pump station in the southeast corner of Foundation Park and that's shown in blue here on the exhibit. Uh, we anticipate that that would begin next year with construction completed uh, by 2017. At this point, these are all approximate dates. Um, then there would also potentially be a phase two. Uh, that would depend on future build out and capacity, as well as the type of industrial development that we would anticipate on this uh, property. Uh, the initial construction estimates for sewer is approximately $7.7 .7 million. Uh, that would be recouped by the city through uh, a platting fee, cost recovery uh, per acre fee, which is currently estimated to be $11,600 on current dollar uh, configuration. Uh, also, any other on-site infrastructure regarding sanitary sewer would be the responsibility of the property owner um, along with the associated fees. For stormwater drainage, we would deal with this the same that we do for other development. Uh, that there would be an annual drainage fee assessed on the property based on the land use and the formula that we have. Uh, further, there would be platting fees involving our drainage system cost recovery charges, as well as our regional district detention charges that have to do with regional BMP or stormwater drainage uh, capacity requirements. Street services, uh, we also have plans to grade and eventually pave uh, Marion Road up to the site from Interstate 90 going north. And the estimated cost on the exhibit to do the roadway improvements is up to $2 million. And that would be done over either a one or a two year time frame uh, with initial grading. And then we would look at the timeline though, of doing uh, a two lane rural section road. So the total upfront cost um, that equal those three items is about 10.5 million of investment. Under zoning, we would allow future industrial as well as commercial uses to be uh, placed on the site through a rezoning process. Uh, all other development fees, platting, plan review, building permits, inspection fees would still be the responsibility of the property owner as future development goes forward. And then uh, with this pre-annexation agreement, the next step in the process would be the actual annexation petition that would be brought to the city council uh, by the property owner. And that could be done as one overall parcel or it could be done in stages. Uh, so that's a real quick overview of what a pre-annexation agreement is all about. And we do have representatives here, as we know Slater Barr, uh, with the Development Foundation. That's a quick overview, so thank you. Mike, very good overview, appreciate that. Uh, before I go to the council, is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Very good, councilors, uh, Councilor Jameson. Uh, Mike, on the uh, Macross and Boys Ranch, uh, I assume, are they in this circle or are they further south yet? They are south, the Macrossan's Boys Ranch owns some of the property involved in this exhibit but they also own land down to Interstate 90. And the Development Foundation is currently working with them uh, because they would also be involved in the future annexation to make the property contiguous with our existing city limits. Right now, our city limits goes up to Interstate 90. So yes, they will be a player in this as well in the future. It just looks like we're kind of leapfrogging them, but they're actually be a part of this. Yes, they will be a part of this. Okay. So those discussions are ongoing right now. Councilor Anderson, Jr. I may have missed this, Mike, but once we have the pre-annexation agreement completed, that will come back to the council to, to review at least, or? The, the pre-annexation agreement would be approved tonight, and then the next step would be the annexation resolution that would have the same type of information in more detail. So we won't see a completed 
pre-annexation agreement as far as the details of what, what is in that? What you have tonight is, uh, as part of the resolution, is Exhibit A, which identifies the different parcels, and Exhibit B, which goes through the information that I just paraphrased. And that there won't be any other changes in there or anything like that, right. correct? But when the annexation resolution comes to you, which is the next step, uh, we'll have similar information only in more detail. That's Thank the you. next step in the process. Uh, Councilor Karski. It's unusual to, to do a pre-annexation agreement, isn't it, Director Cooper? And, and maybe you covered the reason why we're doing it, but it has a lot to do with funding from the state, I believe, the Economic Development Office. Is yeah, we don't correct? do a lot of pre-annexation agreements, but we have done them for different development areas. And I think in this case, because of the, the, uh, the type of financing that's going to be pursued, and maybe Slater wants to come up and talk about that in more detail, Again, in that MOU that we brought to you a while back, we did say that there was going to be a pre-annexation agreement presented to the city council. Thank you, Slater. Thank you. Again, Slater Barr with the Sioux Falls Development Foundation. Yeah, I think you know, the way that I think about this is it's almost the planning equivalent of a term sheet. Very good. So this is kind of laying out the basic parameters of you know, so that all the parties understand these are the different, you know, this is what everyone is going to do leading up to this annexation. So um, it's kind of a concise version that everyone then signs off on and says, um, these are the parameters under which we're all acting and that um, everyone understands what each party is contributing or is doing for this development, you know, leading up to the annexation. The next step would be the full annexation agreement. Slater, very good. That, that was good. I, Council, would anybody want to uh, make a motion to approve this resolution? No, Karski. Rolfing, second. Very good. Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve this resolution, seconded by Councilor Rex Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 47. A resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards as follows. Jeffrey Gednalski to the Board of Ethics, Kermit Staggers, Board of Museum Trustees, Craig Odens and Chad Van Eady to the Electrical Board of Appeals, Dr. Katie Reardon to the Falls Community Health Center Governing Board, Mark DeWitt and Thomas Grunig to the Mechanical Board of Appeals and Examiners, Eric Gajkowski and Sherry Geary to the Public Transit Advisory Board, Crystal Reuter to the School Traffic Safety Advisory Committee PATH, Nancy Wallstrom and Russ Wheeler to the Sioux Falls Regional Emergency Medical Services Authority, and Robert Everett and Michael Jones to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Move to approve. Second. Councilor Erickson, thank you so much. Councilor Rolfing, thank you as well. Uh, Councilor Buck? Public. Yes. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who want to speak to this item? Very good. <laughs> thank you. A roll call vote, please. All right. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Karski? Yes. Kylie? That has passed six to zero. Thank you. Item 48. 48 is a hearing to determine that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the touch market All Saints edition proposal based upon the consideration of all relevant factors and that the program includes all possible planning to minimize harm to the historic property resulting from such use. Danny, would you want to uh, give uh, the public uh, some input on this, please? Sure. Um, Mayor, counselors. The state law requires that any time that there's a project involving a historic property that a certain review process take place. And that state law is South Dakota Codified Law 119A 11.1. .1. That review process starts off with the question being asked by city staff, could this project have a potential adverse impact to a historic district or historic property? If that question is, if that question is answered in the affirmative, then the city is required to uh, present that proposal to our local uh, Board of Historic Preservation. Our local preservation board then looks at the proposal and determines whether or not uh, this proposal could have an adverse impact to the historic district or the hist historic uh, property. 
In the event that it does, uh, that triggers a further review uh, by the State uh, Historic Preservation Board. Uh, in this particular case, our city staff on initial review determined that this had a potential for an adverse impact, which triggered the review by our local board uh, and the State uh, Historic Board. Ultimately, um, our preservation board made a determination that it would have an adverse impact. Um, after that, a case study was prepared as required by statute. That case study was sent to the state. The state reviewed it and made a recommendation or finding um, that the project would damage, destroy, or encroach upon this historic property. As a result, that same statute that I referred to requires if the permit's going to be issued or the project's going to be authorized to move forward, our city council has to make a determination. That determination has to be in writing. And what, and what you have to decide is whether all feasible and prudent alternatives have been looked at. And if none exist, then you can move forward with the next decision or question. Does this program include all possible planning to minimize harm to this historic property? And that's the hearing that's going to come before you today. Um, the process starts with the hearing. Um, in order to ultimately come to written determination, you're going to hear from city staff. They're going to give a report. You're going to hear from Touchmark. Uh, you're going to need to allow opponents and proponents to um, weigh in on this topic. At any time, city council can ask questions. Um, at the conclusion of the testimony, um, you're going to need to ask yourself, did I, you're going to need to ask yourself, is there any information that I'm going to rely upon tonight um, that I didn't hear presented at this public hearing? This is one of those quasi-judicial matters. And so if there's something that you're going to consider that you didn't hear presented to you tonight, you need to disclose that before you take any motions. The reason for that is you need to allow all the parties here to hear what you're giving consideration to so they can have an opportunity to respond to it. After you have concluded all the testimony, made any disclosures if, if necessary, you're going to take the action listed in items 49 and 50 and hear those motions. Whatever action you take on those motions will result in the city attorney's office preparing findings consistent with what you've determined. And that'll be the process. Do you have any questions? Danny, just make sure you don't leave. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you. So right now we're having a hearing, if I understand, and uh, in, in listen to you, you want now uh, city staff along with Touchmark and the public to begin some dialogue. That's correct. Very good. And we'll start with Diane. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Diane DeCoyer again with planning staff. I'm also the staff liaison to the Board of Preservation. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the project and then go through the process as it was presented to the Board of Preservation and let you know how things were voted on at that point. Um, Touch Market All Saints has proposed a 110,000 square foot addition to its existing retirement community campus. The addition will include a 13,500 square foot health and fitness center with an indoor pool, 31 memory care units with a courtyard, 60 independent living units, as well as some structured parking under the building. The massing of the building is designed with a four-story addition along 18th Street, similar to the phase one addition previously constructed to the west of the historic building. Uh, the structure that the addition would attach to is a four-story structure built in 1895 with a quartzite stone facade. Touchmark has maintained the property since purchasing it in 1995, at which time major renovations were undertaken to convert the classrooms into apartments, repair the neglected building, and build a large addition. In 2005, another addition was built, as well as extensive repairs to the roof and structural repairs to the historic brick chimneys. A major facade renovation of the Phase I building was also undertaken at that time. The proposed addition will take up approximately 40% of the open area to the east of the historic building. The existing drive at West 17th Street from east to west will remain untouched with existing landscape. Uh, the Board of Preservation first met on February 11th. Um, the project was reviewed by the board um, where it was decided that it would have an adverse effect on the All Saints Historic District. The board was concerned with the choice of building materials and scale of the adjacent, excuse me, addition adjacent to the historic structure. 
from the south side of the property at 18th Street, which is shown up on the screen right here. Um, it was felt that the addition was crowding the original historic structure. Uh, the south side of the property is considered to be the back of the property, although prominent from 18th Street. 17th Street is the historic entrance and front of the building where the new addition to the east is approximately 25 feet as it was de designed originally from the original building. The scale of the proposed addition is similar to the height and massing of the west addition that was constructed in the 90s. The new building is, is designed to match floor elevations between the building to the west, the historic building in the middle, and the new addition on the east, hence the number of stories and height of the building. The second meeting with the Board of Preservation after it was rejected by the board in February, they came back again with some revisions to the design based on the input that they had from the board members. That was held on March 11th. The applicant resubmitted drawings and images for a second review. Uh, building materials were modified to be more complementary to the historic building. On this image, you can see both from some of the images of the historic as well as the rendering of some of the other accent and material items that they took into account in the second design. Uh, materials include cultured quartzite, lap siding, checkerboard stone accents at gable ends, and decorative coins at the building corners. The board felt again that the proposed design would have an adverse effect on the All Saints Historic District due to the overwhelming height of the building at the south facade and the need of the addition um, to be subordinate to the historic structure. So in summary, at the second meeting, um, although they did change the materials based on the request of the board members, um, they were not able to reduce the height of that building. Um, therefore, the board still felt that it was overwhelming or crowding the historic structure. They did, um, at this point, also move the building, as it shows in this image. Originally, it was about 25 to 27 feet away from the historic building and they moved it an additional, I think, 13 to 14 feet just to give it some more space, again, from the north side there to reduce the crowding there. Also on that side from the north, um, as you can see in this image, the upper left is, as the, the building exists, the historic structure from the north. And then bottom right, um, that's a rendering showing what that addition would look like from 17th. Uh, 17th Street, and that is both a one-story and a two-story addition there. And in the background, you can see the four-story addition where the units are. Um, again, it's not taking anything away from the historic structure on that side. Um, after we completed the board reviews at that time, we were required to submit a case report to the South Dakota Historic Preservation Office. Um, presenting all information. Um, the applicant also assisted with that. We sent that in to the state and they responded um, at the end of April saying that they did feel that um, the project would encroach upon damage or destroy a historic property. Um, also noted that with the instructions um, that the city of Sioux Falls is responsible for determining the fate of the historic structure. The decision must be based on consideration, as Danny mentioned, of all feasible and prudent alternatives pursuant to SDCL 1-19A-11.1. If the city proceeds with the issuance of the permits, 10 days notice by certified mail is required with the city's final determination prior to issuance of any permits. Such notice must include a written determination based on the consideration of all relevant factors, that there is not feasible and prudent alternatives to the proposal, and that all possible planning to minimize harm to the historic property has been made. Um, Touchmark, um, they have representatives here out of Oregon that will speak to some of this some of their design decisions that we um, took part in with them. Uh, it was based on the building program and design decisions on professional assessments from a team of architects and engineers. Their goal was to connect to the existing structure in the most minimal way possible so as not to alter the front and side facades of the historic structure. 
uh, the design team created extensive studies and renderings of the existing and proposed addition to study various views. While many design solutions were explored, the constrictions of attaching to an existing building and a sloping site and limitations and sensitivity to attaching to the existing structure at the rear, which is actually a service entrance at 18th Street. Um, they're not disrupting the front facade. We're all factors in developing their design. The building site chosen is currently being used for overflow parking. The front lawn north of the entry drive will be preserved as open space. Long range community opportunities and touch marks involvement with the community continue to remain paramount. Um, and with the proposed addition, we'll be able to offer expanded service for memory care to the residents and a health and fitness center. Touchmark has been an excellent caretaker of this property um, and relies on their originally approved master plan for expansion to be financially viable, to continue to offer valuable services and amenities to their residents um, and neighbors and maintain the historic building that is an integral part of the campus. Um, Last fall, a rezone application came before you and it was approved. Um, that was rezoned from what was RA3, which is high density apartments, to the S2 institutional campus PUD, which allows for the various um, type of living units that they have on this campus. They also provide an alternative site plan. Uh, it was reviewed and approved by Planning Commission. There's quite a few mature trees on the campus and in an effort to try to maintain as many of those as possible, um, we ask that they provide an alternative to what was required with the buffer yards since there's adjacent residential units both to the east and to the south. So we have here tonight Joe Billick. He is the head of architecture for Touchmark and also Rick Wessel. He's the Vice President of Construction and Development from Beaverton, Oregon, and I will turn it over for them unless you have any questions of me. Danny, is it appropriate for me to go to Touchmark next? Yes. Very good. Uh, with the Touchmark representatives, would you mind coming forward, please, and just introduce yourself to the people of our town. Good evening, Mayor Huther, uh, members of the council, thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Billig. I'm the Senior Vice President of Architecture for Touchmark, and pleased to be here tonight. With me also is Rick Wessel, our Senior Vice President of uh, Construction. Um, tonight what I'd like to do is, um, thank you, Diane, for running through all those exhibits. Um, Diane and I are sharing some slides tonight, so we'll have, um, you'll get to see some of these again. But I do have a few more uh, comments and a little history to offer, and then I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Wessel, and he has a few points on some of the economic impacts um, of this project. And so um, what, um, what we're proposing here is uh, a project that encompasses three, three parts. Um, as Diane mentioned, the Senior Health and Fitness Center um, is a really um, critical piece that we want to add. We have 11 communities uh, right now and two more just breaking ground. But our goal is to really bring a senior health and fitness uh, center to each one of these communities. Um, this, I think, will be our fourth or fifth one that we're, we'll be able to add. And these are really, um, they're designed for our residents. It's a private club. Uh, we have an indoor pool that we maintain a high temperature at, which is great for um, arthritis and movement. We have exercise. We have group classes. Uh, we have a balance program that's an award-winning program that has some pretty high-tech equipment that you can use to um, assess balance and then uh, come up with a corrective program for that. Um, so that's going to be a really key piece that our residents um, will be able to enjoy. Um, another part of the project is the memory care. We currently have a memory care, um, however, it's 15 years old. And as um, we've learned more about the disease and the design has evolved, we've developed a, a, a floor plan that we think is uh, pretty uh, revolutionary and really um, uh, supports those folks uh, afflicted with that disease. It's an open plan. It's divided into two neighborhoods of 16 homes. Uh, we have a shared courtyard in the middle and um, kind of in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that's just a wide open plan, so it provides lots of visibility and sight lines. To support uh, these great uh, features that we need, we're also proposing 60 independent homes. 
And we do know that um, the market is underserved here in Sioux Falls. There is going to be a demand for senior housing. It's a demographic that's growing rapidly. And um, we know there's um, several projects currently under construction and additions going on. And so Touchmark also wants to be competitive in the marketplace and bring forward um, some new homes for residents. And, um, and these homes are important because our senior health and fitness center um, does not generate revenue. That's something that we offer free of charge for our members, but it's a two to $3 million project that does take uh, these revenue generating independent homes to support. Um, so that's, um, that's what we're looking at there for what we're proposing. Um, to take you back a little bit in time, um, in 1994, we acquired the property, and uh, you can see it was in a pretty bad state of uh, neglect and uh, disrepair. And at that time, uh, I think we did have the option to actually raise the buildings. It was not on the historic register at the time, um, so we could have just demoed the whole site and had a clean slate. Um, I guess we wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> but uh, instead, we um, said, no, there's a real value in these buildings. These, these are wonderful um, beautiful buildings here that we really should restore. And so we um, did dive in. We spent a you know, considerable amount of money and effort and um, brought these buildings back to their original glory um, for you know all to enjoy. We have residents um, that actually went to school there who have come back. And um, so that's, that's pretty neat. And not just the outside, but the inside, too. We repaired all and restored the Tiffany stained glass windows and the organ, as well as all the interior woodwork. So we have some pretty magnificent buildings here. And then here is how it looks when we um, completed that. And you can see our phase one addition in the background there. And so I'd like to turn now to the master site plan here um, and draw your attention. In the center of the orange building, we have the historic uh, Chapelwood building. And then off to the west, the uh, historic schoolhouse building. And um, the design at that time uh, was um, to take the four-story building and run that along 18th Street as an edge and put the higher uh, density part there. Um, this design was before my time. I've been with Touchmark 20 years, but this was just before my time there. And the architects at that time decided to attach to the historic structures on the south and west facades of the Chapel Wood and the west and, I guess, south facade as well of the historic building. Um, the historic board at that time did not seem to be as concerned with um, or felt that the building is um, encroached or damaged or destroyed the historic property, nor were they concerned about view corridors coming down 18th Street. So as we went into looking at this next phase, we really took this as a precedent, say, okay, this is what was approved, this has been here, um, it seems to blend in well with the neighborhood and be well received. Uh, here is a view of the four-story addition that we built along 18th Street. And um, when we further designed the building, we said, okay, let's sort of take our architectural cues from this building. So we did. We repeated some of the materials. We still have the quartzite, the cultured stone, but we used um, some CMU block veneer. We have some stucco. Um, we picking up some of the details, the historic details of the coining and the checkerboard details. Um, so that is what we um, kind of submitted there and the, built on the first one. Back to the master site plan, um, over to the east, we said, OK, let's kind of follow the same program there. And so again, we, um, this time, we want to connect to the historic chapel wood, but we wanted to do that in the most minimal way possible. And so we have just the smallest connection on the south side. Um, as Diane mentioned, that's the service entrance. And so we felt, OK, that's really the back side of the structure there, again, aligning the four-story portion along 18th, creating that edge, but really keeping the one-story buildings of the pool and the memory care, and there is some parking daylight below, but keeping those one-story structures on the north side so that we could really preserve that front entry, the formal entry, the historic entry, uh, the grand lawn, and be able to see that building and not encroach on it um, as one's coming up the front drive and viewing it along 17th Street. And this is the first rendering that we submitted um, and presented to the Board of Historic Preservation. And again, they said, well, we really didn't like what you did in the first phase. We would prefer if you um, really mimicked a little bit more of the historic building. And so we'd like to see more stone. We don't want to see any stucco. There was lap siding on the original building. You could use that. Uh, maybe pick up uh, some more detailing with the checkerboard gables or the header details. 
And um, so we said, okay. Um, oh, and, and they also were concerned about the size and scale of the building, and in particular um, about how it was going to block the historic building from 18th Street. So we said, okay, and we went back and said, well, we can make some significant changes at, again, considerable cost to the project, had more stone and these materials and detailing, but yes, that makes sense, and that's what we want to do. So we, we did that and presented this, this rendering here, a uh, lot, more, lot more of the cultured stone, more of the detailing. Um, but again, the historic board rejected it and um, felt that um, you know, it was really too big in scale. They did appreciate the changes that we made and thought those actually looked, looked pretty nice as far as the building elevations were concerned there. Um, so, um, and I think Diane shared this one already, but these are some of the details that we presented of what we, um, what we based our design on. And so we also in that meeting said, well, you know, we, we don't think that our building really does block the historic building from 18th Street. And keep in mind, I think we, you know, the board's position was, how is this building viewed from the corner of 18th and Phillips a block and a half away? Well, is that reasonable to be able to see this building a block and a half away? You know, why not 10 blocks away? And so we put together some more renderings of actual photos. And this one here is taken um, in the winter. And you can see that the trees are the, what really block the historic structure, even in the middle of winter with no foliage, you can imagine with full foliage. Um, you just can't see the buildings in the corner of 18th and Phillips. And then we presented this next rendering, uh, which is our proposed building. Again, uh, a little further down 18th Street as one is moving to driving towards the west. But you can see that we can clearly still see our historic structure there uh, from the south side. And this is, again, what we're sort of considering the back side. Um, from the front north side, uh, we really are keeping it very open. And as um, Diane mentioned, we draw your attention sort of the upper uh, southeast corner there of Phillips and 18th, um, just to kind of get you oriented here on the next slide. That's a blow up of that corner. And we um, did go in for this alternative site buffer. Um, the easier thing to do would have just been to handle the stormwater detention on grade with a series of berms and swales and biofiltration and collect it on grade. But that would have been taking down uh, quite a number of trees along Phillips. And so um, the trees ha have, have been a passionate topic. Um, we've certainly had a lot of discussion with our neighborhood association on that. Touchmark feels as strongly as they do. We don't want to take down any trees either. Um, but we feel that in the interest and the benefits that this project will bring to our residents, that might outweigh taking down some trees. We also know that many of the trees on the site are uh, decaying. Um, the trees do have a lifespan. We've had a lot of storm damage. So there may have been some peripheral discussion about trees. While it's not necessarily relevant to pertinent to today's discussion, I did want to mention that you know, we are especially sensitive to that and came up with this alternative site plan that allowed us to save trees. And then any trees that we will have to take down will be replanted. And uh, the, um, the direction was that we would have to plant with two inch caliper trees. And so we will do that. And then um, in preparation for the state report that Diane put together, we put together a few more exhibits and renderings. And so again, this one showing uh, on the left the historic structure without the addition and on the right with the addition. Again, feeling that we're building something that's compatible with the structure and something that uh, does not take away from the historic structure as well. And even after we were sort of denied twice by the board, we weren't planning to go back again, but we still want, you know, we had neighborhood meetings, um, we were listening. One of the comments was, you know, is there any way you can pull that building further away? And so we will continue to develop the, the design and actually came up with a way to, uh, again, cost to the architects and engineers who are about 50% dumb, but said, you know, let's, let's see what can we do more. Um, and we were able to pull that building from 25 feet from the historic structure to 40 feet um, on that south side. And then lastly, um, you know, we, we know that this is a community, this is a site that's enjoyed by the entire neighborhood association. It's, um, it's a park-like setting, and we plan to maintain that even with this addition. Um, we will have 70% open space with the addition on this site. 
And so again, we're going to preserve, um, let's just jump back a couple slides here, preserve the entire front north lawn, everything north of the entry drive. Um, we still will have our municipal band concerts, um, invite uh, neighbors in and um, feel that we will you know, still be able to have a great project here. So thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions for me, let me know. And um, Jess, why don't we uh, why don't we go to Rick? Sounds and great. then and then we'll um, uh, allow the public the opportunity to, to respond. And then we'll go to the council with uh, I'm sure a variety of questions. Terrific. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council members. Uh, we're glad to be able to speak to you about this tonight. This was honestly a bit of an unexpected bump in the road, but uh, but, but we're here to uh, certainly explain where we're coming from and, and why we think this is a great project, not just for Touchmark, but for the city. So I, I will talk to you a little bit, uh, maybe initially from a broader perspective about, about the benefits of this project uh, for the city, the growing need for senior housing, which Joe's touched on briefly, the, in particular the growing need for memory care and, and health and wellness services and, and, uh, and the reasons we're needing to include that in this phase. Um, a little bit of history on our development plan for the project and, and how we've gotten to where we are. Um, the alternatives that we've considered, and, and, then, and then I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the Board of Historic Preservation Review. Rick, I'm going to ask you a favor, though. Uh, I'm going to ask you not to duplicate uh, what has already been discussed by Diane and by Jez. I, I'm getting some duplication. I don't want any more, if that's okay. Uh, sure. I, this has been vetted in a grand, grand way. It's a great hearing. But I'm going to ask you, if there's any duplication, let's eliminate that and go to the heart of what you want to present. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, and if I get off track, feel free to correct me, and I'll I guarantee try to you I will. <laughs> okay. So, so first of all, let's 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 just talk about job growth and and, and tax revenues. I think those are things that um, that should be important in considering projects of this type. Obviously, historic issues are important as well. But, but I think it's worth pointing out that, that just the construction of this project alone is going to create 150 construction jobs for the, for the purpose of, of getting us up and operating. Um, we'll add uh, 40 full-time Touchmark employees to this project. That equates to over a million dollars in wages. And as you probably know, there's a, there's a ripple effect that goes with that as those wages flow into the community. Uh, we've done studies uh, in, in other locations and, um, and found that, that correlation is substantial in terms of the other jobs um, in the neighborhoods that are created. And so those are, for instance, our, our growing need for continuing construction and maintenance efforts um, uh, as we get more residents, more health care providers, for instance, in, in our situation, um, retail, restaurants, hotels. Um, all those sort of events, uh, you know, increased participation in civic events and concerts, and, and we also shouldn't overlook the effects of, of volunteerism in terms of our residents and the ability to grow our community. Those are all, I think, great benefits for the city and, and our residents as, as retirees. Many of them have uh, very strong and varied backgrounds, and, and, and I think they're valuable to the community from the perspective of, of the things that they can bring. Uh, tax revenues, obviously, uh, are, are another big issue. The, the city essentially, from our perspective at least, partnered with Touchmark back when we started this project, provided tax increment financing. A lot of that was oriented around finding a way to, to keep these historic buildings and not tear them down. We, we were able to do that, and, and, and I think the benefits to the city have been enormous. Our, our taxes last year, just for our community, we're $336,000, that's just property taxes. There's, there's a small incremental sales tax effect as well. And, and we expect that with the expansion, not just in terms of the value of the expansion itself, but what it does for the value of the entire community, it's gonna to lead to an enormous increase in property taxes just from us. And, and again, when you talk about the, the ripple effect, um, you know, we've analyzed and, you know, and estimated what we think that indirect tax revenues might be as a result of those other 98 jobs that get created and, and the other income that comes into the community from all of those activities. And, and those numbers uh, could actually lead to larger tax revenues than what we provide as, as touch mark. 
to give you just a little bit more background on that, this, this chart shows you our, our projections for uh, on a single year basis and shows you what we paid at various intervals along the way. And, and the lighter color at the top shows, shows the value that the expansion itself would bring to those tax revenues. But in addition, it, it accelerates the, the value of, of the tax revenues that we're currently paying. If you look at that on a cumulative basis, you can see that here in 2015, we've paid in the neighborhood so far of five and a half million dollars in property taxes. And by 2020, we expect that to top eight million dollars. And uh, if we look out to 2023, it's ten million dollars. And those are those are significant monies that that I hope we all appreciate, and we're certainly willing to invest in, in making a better community. But this this project, if allowed to proceed, will bring great benefits to the city. The other thing to talk about a little bit and more specifically about the, the need for senior housing, and again, I'll, I'll try not to be duplicative, but I, but I think a point, the thing to point out here is that if we look at the population of those 65 plus within just a five mile radius of this project, um, it's expected to grow by more than 23% through 2019. Now that's an enormous number, honestly. When we do these studies in other communities, we maybe see more like two to 3% year over year, and this is substantially more than that. And so, so what that says is like it or not, the city's gonna need a lot of senior housing in the years to come. And that's probably no surprise. We all understand what the baby boomers are doing and the impact that they're having. Um, as we study the existing retirement communities in the city today, they're full as we are. And, uh, and in addition, the number of projects that are on the books now are not gonna meet the demand. And so, so we think this is another area in which we're actually bringing value to the community by providing a much needed service. <clears throat> to talk a little bit about the, the original plan, when we started this project in, in, um, in 1994 and, and laid out the performa and, and study what it would take to make this work, we, we actually planned, and this is the basis that we went to our investors and to the city when we partnered for this project, we, we planned on 280 homes. We currently, after two phases of construction, have 151. Um, I think you're fully aware that we're planning 91 more. The total, is, which is what I want to point out here, you know, only gets us to 242. Now that's a significant difference from the 280 when you consider the health and vitality of the, the community from an operational perspective. But, um, but that's where we are, and we realize that this is, this is the end. This is all that, that Touch Market All Saints will be. We have no plans for further expansion, and so when we talk about protecting some of these other areas on site, that's, that's forever. So that, that leads us into a discussion of, of some of the development alternatives that, that we considered and that have been suggested and, and why they're not feasible or, or prudent in, in light of what it is we're trying to do here. And so to give you a couple examples, so, so one was that, well, the building's too tall, why don't, why don't we take a floor off? So, so that would cost us 20 homes. And to put that in, in a little bit of perspective, that's, that's $850,000 in revenues. I, I wish it was profits, but it's revenues. So, um, so, so that's, a, that's a major hit. And that's, that's something like a 22% reduction in the number of units that we plan today. We've already taken a, a, a 15 to 16% reduction in getting from 280 to 242. So alternatively, if, if we needed a to preserve that number of units, in theory, we could expand the building footprint. But, but our analysis, and I think you can see from the photos, is that the impact that would have on the site in terms of working on the steeper portions or around the northern side, it's just not an acceptable alternative. And, and, and so we, we think that, that the height is, is a reasonable trade-off for, for some of these other alternatives about spreading up and, and spreading out and using more of the site. Uh, as, as Joe mentioned, the, the memory care and the health and wellness aspects are also very important parts of the program, very important for seniors in the years to head in terms of maintaining their health and their fitness in the years to come, reducing their impact on the medical system and everything else. And, and so they're a necessary part of the, of the footprint for this building. We have we've done the best that we can to minimize the impact of that by keeping the building heights down for those areas. And, and we, again, think uh, after looking at a number of alternatives that that's the most prudent route to take. Um, I, I, I won't spend any more time on green space. I think we've made it clear. I just would say 70% is an astounding number for a fully built out 
project. I, I hope everybody realizes that. <clears throat> so um, I, I said that I, I would talk a little bit about um, the BHP review. Uh, I, I think it's important because, because the standard that we're being held to here today is that we need to consider all feasible and prudent alternatives to, to the plan that we proposed. And I think it's necessary to point out that the, the, the Bureau of Historic Preservation's review and therefore the State Board's review was focused much more narrowly than that. It really considered only issues of, of, a, of design, aesthetic and scale, if you will. And so there's, there has been no consideration on their part for all the other factors involved that I'm, I'm explaining to you here today. And, 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 I, and that's why I think it's, it's essential that, that we be able to look beyond that as we're talking about this today and you consider the approval of this project. And it's because, it's because that what the statute provides for is a look at the larger picture, not just strictly the aesthetic impact. Uh, one other thing that's, that's important in that regard with respect to the building height is also an issue that has to do with our residents and that's that forcing them to move large horizontal distances when some of them have limited mo mobility is difficult and they function better in a, in a vertical environment. So the truth is that buildings are a little taller so they can change places by elevator rather than having to walk long distances is a, is a significant benefit to them. And that's one of the other things that, that makes what we have a more reasonable and prudent approach to what we're trying to do. I would also point out that, that the, it, from our perspective, we, we always planned for this project to, um, to consume the site that we're consuming today. And by that, I mean we always intended for this to extend down 18th Street to Phillips. That's the only way to get 280 units, and, and now it's the only way to get 242 units. So, so this is consistent with the original plan that we had when, when we first worked with the city in 1994 to, to work this project out. We, we have not changed our approach in that regard with the exception of reducing the number of units. However, this Board of Historic Preservation, um, we think has taken a different view than the previous approvals that we had, and I, and I think you can see that. <clears throat> so where we are now, uh, you know, we, you know, we believe we should be entitled to complete this project within the scope of, of the, the original approval that we had, and, and, and we're clearly within, within the bounds of that scope. Um, We've taken every step that we can to, uh, to minimize the impacts of this project on the historic building, um, and, and, and we, we, we hope that gets recognized. Uh, the other, th some other points that we should make is that um, there's been a lot of discussion about the neighbors and their input on this project, and while so much of that was focused around trees, we should remember that, that our residents are neighbors too of the All Saints neighborhood and, and, and they're very much a part of the fabric of that community. And I can tell you they, they strongly support this project. They strongly support the services that it's gonna bring. They're 150 strong and they want us to be able to do this project and they understand the implications that this has on the historic building. To summarize a little bit, um, honestly, from our perspective, historic preservation should be should be about a lot more than what you see when you drive by on the street, and and that's what we feel we're we're furnishing with our community. Um, we have a number of events every year that that the public is welcome to. They come and enjoy the community. There's an annual Easter egg hunt. We have a actually for the All Saints neighborhood. We we uh, routinely host an ice cream and pie social the municipal band concert, um, the Chapelwood um, building is available for weddings and memorials, so there's, there's public input there. Um, you may not be aware that there's actually a museum display inside the building that explains the history of, of, um, of All Saints and, and is there to help educate not just our residents but the public as well. So from our perspective, our, our restoration of this building, as the owners of these buildings, no one is more concerned about the health and well-being of the historic buildings than, than we are. And um, we own them, we're proud to own them. We have spent significant dollars for significant um, maintenance expenses related to these buildings, and we, we have to be able to fund those for the long term. 
So, um, so we're trying very hard to use this project as a way to help do that. We, we feel that these, these buildings um, offer our residents um, a place to actually live, work, and play in the buildings themselves. These are, these are not buildings that you drive by that, that, um, that you just look at or, or you spend the weekends on. These residents live there every day. Our employees live there every day. And, and not only that, um, their families, their friends, including kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, all come to actually physically touch and enjoy these buildings and learn some of the history of what we have there. And to us, that's what historic preservation should be all about. And, and that's why we're asking for your approval to do this project as we presented it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions as, as Joe would as, as well. Rick, very good job. We appreciate that. Uh, now, Danny, if it's appropriate, to, before I go to the council and have them ask questions, can I go to the, to the public then for their testimony as well? Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Uh, folks, I, I appreciate your patience. Uh, I know it's late, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, you certainly have the ability to give your testimony as well. I, I would ask you just come forward, introduce yourself to the people of our town, and um, I, I, I will relay the same thing to you as I did to these two gentlemen, and that is, if you can, uh, just have your comments be unique uh, certainly be uh, supportive or, or against it, uh, and if it, in, in it, try not to be duplicative in nature, if at all possible. Sir, welcome. Well, sir, I just wish I would have gone first. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, well, you're, you go right ahead, and, and we wish good you the very good best. Good evening to you. I am Commander Gail A. Christensen, United States Navy, retired. I'm a native of South Dakota. After 35 years of military and federal service, I returned to Sioux Falls seven and a half years ago, specifically so that my wife could, I'm sorry, I, am I doing all right? There's, I can hear reverberation, sorry. Uh, I returned seven and a half years ago with my wife specifically so that she could be placed in the memory care unit here at All Saints. I went into an independent apartment at All Saints at the same time, and we currently are both residents at All Saints. Having said that, I would like to touch on three points briefly because they have been touched on before. One is the neighborhood interaction. My wife and I, because of her mobility, I have the ability to walk with her daily on the half mile sidewalk around All Saints, both directions, one way in the morning, one way in the afternoon, interacting with the neighbors almost daily in that walk. And we feel very comfortable as being part of the neighborhood if you will. The second point is uh, since I've come back to Sioux Falls, I've become involved in Center for Active Generations, the AARP Tax Foundation uh, Taxpayer Preparation Program, the AARP Safe Driver Program. So in interacting with seniors in that regard, I would affirm on a subjective level the need for housing, specifically memory care units. And I would dare say that on a personal level, there's probably some folks in our general population that could use additional care if All Saints had the room. On the third level, uh, the historic preservation, I'm a member of the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation. I feel very important about South Dakota. I am a resident. Uh, I won't ask for a raise of hands, but I was born in Brookings. My Folks, though, are from West River, if that's okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we, we were, uh, uh, they were both graduates of state. And so I, I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of South Dakota Historical Society. The reason I bring that up is I am taken with the museum that was mentioned. Very few people, I think there's a doctoral dissertation in that museum in the, in the documentation and the artifacts that are there in the All Saints museum area that we've got in the Chapelwood building. So with that having been said, uh, I want to thank Mayor Huther for being there during a recent campaign time. He got to see all the oak furniture, the tall 14, 15 foot uh, ceilings that are there and some of that exquisite uh, architecture that's inside. Thank you very much for your time. Commander, thanks for your service as well as thank you for your, uh, your testimony tonight. We appreciate that. Welcome.
Uh, Craig Lloyd, 101 South Reed Street, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I was doing my math a little bit ago, and when I spoke to this group about All Saints, I was 46 years old and I had hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, talk about history. Uh, you know, I've met with Werner Nessler, who was the owner of uh, uh, the uh, organization that owns this, as Touchmark, and uh, Bernie Neal back in 1980, 1993. Showed him around town, showed him a lot of spaces. At one time, this was going to be out on Louise Avenue uh, across from Walmart. And uh, we kept on going around. He says, geez, I think we should need to be closer in town. Finally, we came to the All Saints, and you've seen the pictures. And he said, what about this site? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's for, for sale, and uh, you can buy it. You've got these historic buildings, so we have to go through that. And we walked through the buildings. Uh, I don't know if we had more pigeons there that day or mice, but we had one of the two more than the other. And the, the building was really in bad deterioration. There was a couple other buildings on the, on the site that when we walked through, that one of, uh, one of my feet, I'll never forget, fell through the floor. And he says, well, this might not be a perfect uh, building for us. Uh, which was an old white building behind uh, the main structure. Uh, but anyway, we went through all this, and Werner made a commitment at that point in time after going through the chapel, walking up the stairs, going through the building. It was nothing but chasms of uh, small rooms and small dormitories, if you can remember, back in the 1800s. So he made a commitment at that time to try to restore those buildings. And I think he regretted it about 150 times when we got into those buildings because every time we turned around, uh, it was a, a new experience. Everything from the foundation crumbling to the rafters coming in. Uh, we had to hire a crane to hold up the roof uh, at one point in time so it wouldn't fall from the inside out and, and crush everything and, and us too. We got TIFs from the city of Sioux Falls, which is TIF number two, I believe. It's paid off. At that time, you know, it hadn't paid taxes for over 100 years. And he just went through how much taxes they've paid for this building. And, you know, they could have made the decision to tear it down. And they could have torn it down. They just had to give the right notices and everything else. But they didn't do that. They went to the next step. And I just got to meet these two gentlemen today, which was really a pleasure, because I got to re reiterate some of the, my experiences in working with Werner and his group on redoing that building, building the new buildings, going through all the issues that we did at that time. Uh, I don't think anybody can ever say that the 280 units was, that's what was always on the plans. That was always planned. Matter of fact, it was being more obtrusive, our original plans, than there's there today. So uh, when they put out a PPM to their investors, that's a legal binding document. So you're not going to make one thing up in one place and come back in another. And for them to take the uh, economic sacrifice, I think, is very good. So in closing, uh, the, the city made the commitment to help them out to make sure that that building stayed there and do all the things they did. And I'm sure if you've never been through it, you've got to go through it because they did a fantastic job, not only on the outside, but the inside. Uh, they've maintained a lot of things. Something that uh, most of you probably don't know, but uh, the original bishop was uh, in the front yard there that connected the uh, old chapel and uh, the, the, we call it the old schoolhouse or the gym. And we had to exhume him. And that was a, more of a an interesting program that I've ever been through in my life. But he now is resting down at the Episcopal Church down here. And that was, uh, it took us about a year to get that done. So they went through a lot of efforts to make sure things happen and happen the right way. And I commend them for that. And I hope you also recognize all the issues that they went through. Thank you. Craig, thank you so much as well. Welcome. Miss? Just pull those down, please. Thank you. 
Just tell us your name, Yay. please. Uh, my name is Leslie Hobel Heinrich. Leslie. Um, I came here tonight because uh, going to a city council meeting is on my bucket list. So, um, and uh, and um, when I first moved to Sioux Falls uh, 15 years ago, I was 18 year old kid, and I remember the trademark building, uh, the All Saints building, and I was like, wow! I moved here from Yankton, uh, South Dakota. So I've, I've uh, Born and raised in South Dakota as well. Anyway, um, Sioux Falls has a castle. Um, and, you know, I mean, I just thought that was huge because Yankton wasn't very big back then. And, uh, and Sioux Falls wasn't quite that big yet either back then. It wasn't as big as it is now. It's like twice the size of what it was then. Um, and so our elderly is going to grow because of that. And it's a historic district. So, of course, the elderly in that neighborhood is going to be a little bit larger. And um, 15 or 10 years ago, I bought a house um, in this neighborhood, and I bought a house in this neighborhood because of its historical integrity. And I don't want to seem insensitive or that I don't care about the elderly in this community, but I live right by a hospital already, you know. Um, and, uh, and I remember the construction and what they've done to that building that's in the last 15 years. When I was, came in, it looked like this beautiful little, this beautiful castle. And, and now it's this huge pink monstrosity that whenever somebody needs to clean the windows, 18th Street is closed, you know. And, um, and so uh, I guess I like the, the new plan opposed to the pink. I felt a lot of stucco pink, but... Um, as far as the historical integrity of why I purchased a house in this neighborhood, it takes away a lot from it for me as a community member. Um, and uh, so that is what I have to say about that. Very good, Leslie. Thank you so much. Welcome. My name is Ron Lamberty, and I live at... Uh, 112 West 17th Street, which is a very close neighbor to the All Saints complex. I became a member of the All Saints District in 1974. We purchased the house at 20th and Phillips, and our family lived there until 1997. We sold it in 2000. We uh, sold our house that was uh, on Elmwood and uh, decide, decided to do apartment living because we like to travel and we didn't want to burden our children with the upkeep and so forth. Uh, one of the things that we kept referring to was the All Saints District being home. And so three years ago, we came back to the Cambridge Apartments. And our apartment is on the second floor of the 112 building, which looks out directly on that lawn now. Some of it isn't lawn, but some of it is. And <clears throat> after seeing the plans and so forth, uh, I think that we would have a much better view of the new building. and as far as the aesthetics of it are concerned, the the western expansion was not that big a thing as far as I was concerned in terms of what it did for the original building, the chapel, and so forth. So we are hopeful that we will have that addition made and that we will see uh, something besides the trees and lawn, but we know we're going to see the uh, front lawn just pretty much the way it is. And uh, we're, we're just hopeful that this will go through. Thank you. Mr. Lamberty, thank you as well, sir. Appreciate that. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, Council, um, raise the speakers. Um, my name is Steve Metley, and uh, I fulfilled Mike's role here at the time that these people were coming through with the original project. 
And uh, everything they're telling you tonight about that at that time is very true. There was concern that we were gonna have to tear that building down. And as you know, that building is the centerpiece of that entire neighborhood. And the, they, at the time that they built it, they did tell us they planned to double the size in the future when, the, when there was the feasibility for it. Uh, and I think that's what they're, they're proposing, something less than that now. But uh, I think it's uh, very important to the neighborhood that this project continue on. I think uh, if you take a look at the neighborhood today, uh, 20 years ago, uh, that neighborhood itself not, was crumbling, as was the um, uh, All Saints itself. And if you look today to the north, to the south, east, and west, homes are being improved. It's a much, uh, I'm happy to say, a much better neighborhood today than it was 20 years ago. And I think uh, a large part of that is due to the project that these gentlemen have done. They did a magnificent job on restoring the historic character of that, that building. And uh, they've done a very, very great service for the, to the community, for the people they serve. And I just uh, would add my uh, encouragement that uh, this project be approved. Thank you. Mr. Manley, thank you as well for your service and thank you for your testimony. Yep. Appreciate it. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilors. My name is Tom Schnabel. I live at 903 South Dakota. That's directly west the touch mark on Dakota Avenue. I've lived there since 1978. We have a castle in our neighborhood. And 15 years ago, that castle was full of mice and pigeons. They have done a marvelous job as a neighbor of restoring that building with their first and second additions. The plans for this next edition don't do anything more than enhance it even more, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they're a wonderful neighbor. I, I can't reiterate that enough. They are a terrific neighbor. They are a terrific citizen in this, in this community. And I think this project should be approved. Thank you. Mr. Schnabel, thank you so much for your testimony as well. Uh, welcome. Folks, if there's anybody else who wants to testify, if you wouldn't mind just coming on up, uh, getting ready, that we'd, we'd certainly appreciate that. Uh, welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council, for the record, George Hahn, proud fourth generation South Dakota and third generation resident of Sioux Falls along with hundreds of other families, not only in this area, but throughout the entire country, there are relationships with all saints that go back to the mid-1880s. Uh, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, both knew Bishop Hare, contributed to his efforts. It was a magnificent school. When it almost went down to the wrecking ball in the early 1990s, there were those of us who cried. Then along comes the Savior Saint, the predecessor to Touchmark and made it whole again. They have been an incredible neighbor. I live in that neighborhood. I know countless people who live in that neighborhood and have great things to say about the stewardship of the neighborhood, their care of the land, the grounds, the employees like it there, the residents, many of whom I personally know, like it there. I just pray to God I don't need their services too soon. They're fulfilling the destiny that I was told about by a gentleman by the name of Don Foss in the early 1990s, part of the original development team. That was to expand and develop more aging in place facilities. That's very important. They need to expand the areas of technology and residency to accommodate those of us who are aging and need more facilities. Their, their destiny is to expand. I wish it could be 280 units. I understand economics, I understand development. But what they're willing to compromise to do has been, I think, above and beyond the call of duty. They have been excellent taxpayers, excellent employers, and great neighbors. What more can you ask? I support your decision to approve this project. Thank you. You bet, Mr. Hahn, thank you so much. Welcome. 
Good evening, Mayor, Councilman, George Hamilton, affectionately known as the Mayor of Main Avenue. <laughs> I wish I had time to introduce you to all of my friends, some of you who sit amongst the council members right here, but I would briefly like to make this statement. I am a proud property owner in the All Saints neighborhood, and in my own way, I feel that I have a positive effect on my neighborhood. The choices that I make for my properties affect my neighbors and tenants, and Touchmark at All Saints is no different. Just like me, Touchmark looks to fulfill its long-term positive plans for its property, which it purchased and has been a great steward and caretaker of. As we look for approval of this addition, I ask that you consider touch marks, positive choices, and decisions in the past in developing the property while preserving a historical piece of Sioux Falls heritage. They are a good neighbor and a positive contributor to our community, and I trust they will preserve the jewel that is All Saints as they have done in the past. Thank you. Mayor Hamilton, folks, thank you. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, folks, anybody else uh, want to engage the council on this, uh, this important topic? Truly, well, truly, we, uh, we thank you for your testimony. We thank you for your patience. Uh, certainly thank you for your passion. Uh, now, Danny, I need to turn to you because you're coaching us along this journey. Uh, it, it, uh, do we now ask questions during the hearing, or do we now turn it over to, uh, uh, to item 49? Coach us, please. Well, if you have any questions of the people that presented, you'd ask those now if you had questions. Very good. If you don't have any questions, then you should take this time to make any disclosures, if you need to make disclosures, so the individuals out there have a chance to respond. If you don't have any disclosures, and you don't have any questions, and you want to move for discussion, you should make the motion as set forth in your agenda. Uh, that's motion 49? Correct. Okay, very good. Uh, then, council, uh, you've heard Danny Brown. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, and then, uh, after we ask questions, then you have to, if you have any, uh, what did you call them? Disclosures. Disclosures, then we'll do that next. So, th let's, this is a, Q, a question time. Uh, Councilor Kiley. Questions? Uh, please. Okay. Um, It's, it's confusing to me, the phase one and two, what authorization had to be obtained in order to proceed. And also, was phase three presented as something at that time that, that would be coming? So in other words, was phase three discussed when this whole project began back in the 90s? And then when it did, and I guess uh, whoever can answer this question can come up to the podium. Maybe the touch mark people would be most uh, appropriate. But uh, uh, the action that uh, the Historic Board of Preservation took at that time. I, with respect to the process that was implemented for, for phase one and phase two, honestly, I, I would wonder if Diane could maybe help us with that a little bit. Um, because because Joe and I frankly are, are a little unclear. We we know there were some approvals that requ were required, but but I think there have been some changes in the process in the interim, and so 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 I can't do a great job of answering that question. I, I will say with respect to the overall plan, and when phase three might have been presented, that the, the phasing was was probably unclear with respect to the timing and the various pieces. So um, so the master plan essentially established the the basic footprint, albeit reduced today, from what was there. Um, and, and phase one was pretty clear, I think, at that point in time, because, because it did show um, what we were going to build imminently. But, but phase two and now phase three, I don't think we're ever really identified it as phases as such. And so they've kind of evolved as market conditions evolved, and we adjusted the unit mix and those other things to what we really wanted. And to I do. don't know if the phases are as important, I guess, to, to my question, but the master plan probably is. So the master plan that was presented back then did include uh, a structure on the side that the proposal is for tonight. Yes, yes. And at that time, uh, the Board of uh, Historic Preservation ruled in favor. 
Well, and, and unfortunately, that's what, where I'm not much help, and, and, and I don't know if, if, if any of the planning folks were here at that time, but... but. Diane, the question is uh, simply back in the original um, uh, concept, I, was this part of the, was an expansion on this side of the building part of it, as well as did the Board of Historic Preservation back then have a, have a, um, um, an opinion on that, that, that development? Um, I don't know the details of it. I do know it was presented to the Board of Preservation back in the 80s, mid to late 80s, um, as a master plan. Um, the project to the west of the historic structure is what was reviewed and approved at that time. Is the project to the west really any taller at, at, at all than what it is to the east? Um, so it may be slightly different, but from what I can tell, it is the same as what they're proposing. Perhaps that I've seen it, it it's hard to yeah. discern. And Thank again, you. because they're matching floor elevations throughout, you know, the horizontal um, access and transition through the facility, it would make sense that it's consistent. Thank you. Very good. Good start. Uh, Councilor Karski. Thank you. When we started the hearing, well, first of all, I have nothing to disclose. I have no information outside of what I've heard tonight. But when we started tonight, we heard three things. And I don't know if this was decided upon by the State Board of Historic Preservations, but three terms were used, encroach upon, damage, or destroy. And it's obvious that this building is not being destroyed, nor likely is it being damaged. And I would think that encroach upon would be a very subjective standard to apply here. So can somebody tell me, I'm, I'm reading all the hearing information, the true basis. It seems that part of our hearing is to determine no feasible and prudent alternative and that um, all possible planning to minimize harm to the historic property resulting from such use has been done. What are we missing here? What, what was the basis for denial? Um, the board, what they review for each project that comes before them on a monthly basis, um, their standards for new construction and additions to a historic property. They take all of these elements, which include, which include compatibility of design, massing size and scale, um, height, width, proportion, rhythm and scale, materials, color, details, roof shape and skyline, setting within the um, historic property, landscaping and ground cover. So they review each of those items to make a determination. I think in this case, what they felt is though it was encroaching on the historic property based on the height of it and the feeling that maybe it was screening some of the um, historic building from 18th Street. So so it is truly is subjective. It's what they felt or thought. Right. Okay. And they did review the materials um, and they made suggestions. And as suggested earlier, Touchmark did make some revisions and they were appreciative of that. Based on those. Thank you. Correct. Councilor Erickson, I, I think you were next. I just have a question for Danny, I guess. Um, I'm just curious. I appreciate everyone being here and I. I <coughs> Looking through the information, I mean, I kind of know where my thoughts are, but I'm curious since it is a quasi judicial, there's nobody opposing this. And so, my question is is that something that they can't come to or they just choose not to come to as far as the state and the historic board? I'm just questioning it as far as uh, they just chose to not come and, and relay what their feelings were, or how does that work? Well, I, I couldn't speak to why people didn't show up tonight in opposition to this. Um, they had the option to. It wasn't have. that they couldn't be here. Correct. It, okay. It's a public uh, public hearing. Anybody could show up and voice their opinions one way or the other. Okay. I just needed clarification just to make sure that they had the option of being here or, or however. So I don't have any questions and I have nothing Counselor, to disclose. Thank you. To be fair, uh, the, I, I, think there, the, the, I think there was one individual who did uh, express some opposition <laughs> to it tonight, just to be fair. Right. Uh, Councilor Buck. I do have a disclosure. I take this project very personally. You know, the first house that my husband and I owned in Sioux Falls was two blocks from the All Saints building. 
in night and we bought it in 1989 so you know what the building looked like then and i that's that was the the grand lawn it was where i did my puppy training with our first dog that's where i did all our leash training would walk past this the grave for bishop hare this is a very personal place for me my other disclosure i have very close personal friends in that area including mayor hamilton i didn't recognize you in your wonderful attire i love the tie i just I, I, I too looked at, I'm as big on historic stuff as everybody else is here. I looked at those ugly words, you know, destroy, encroach, all those ugly, those are ugly words. I'm really concerned about what, has, what could happen to this building and based on what the historical people are saying. But then I also look at those pictures that reminded me of what I was walking around 25 years ago and, and it could have been destroyed it couldn't be stand. It, there, it, there's a possibility it wouldn't be standing there now, or it could have turned into like a funky little weird museum that just didn't make it and ended up failing anyway. So I guess if, it, I know we're not to that point, but what I'm saying to you is I think that we make that determination. I think that we move forward with this and that we support these folks that have been such great neighbors and that have re restored this, really restored this neighborhood. Because I remember, Mr. Metley's right. That neighborhood was kind of sketch for a while, and it's not so much anymore. So. Thank you, guys. Danny, did we do that? Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilors, any other questions? Uh, yes, Councilor? Rolf. Rolf, yes, sir. I know that well. Uh, or the mayor, mayor to be yeah. or whatever and you I'm want. The, to, and I'm the one when they, when they talked about uh, an aging, aging population. I don't know why Joe was looking right at me, <laughs> but he was. And so um, we'll just go with that. I, I just want to express... Um, a couple of things, you know, it, it talks about how we can, how this can be changed to make it blend, blend in better or no feasible or prudent alternatives. I think they've done what they need to do on this to make it that way. And I like what the Board of Preservation said, you know, make those few other changes to match up with what you had on the, on the West and do all that kind of thing in the trees, et cetera, et cetera. But I got to just express that I am very disappointed that the uh, Board of Preservation, uh, Historic Board of Preservation, is, <clears throat> is not here, someone, to argue their point or point out where we may be wrong. And, um, you know, I, it just makes absolutely no sense to me other than <clears throat> maybe they knew it was a lost cause and they, what they had done was, uh, was not in the best interest of the community and the property. If I just may comment on that, um, at the meeting we had last week, Danny was at that, and he did invite, we stressed to the board members, they could come and attend and um, state maybe their opposition, but they would have to do that as an individual citizen. They would not be able to speak on behalf of the board. Mm -hmm. So just a clarification on that. That's what these people are doing here too tonight. Councilors, I'm going to ask... Uh, if, if you can, just in this part of the hearing, or in the hearing, if you could just keep your comments to questions and disclosures. And then uh, we'll move on from there, uh, if there is a motion. I would move. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask, well, we're still in this hearing, okay. so do you have a question, Councilor? It's a disclosure. It's a disclosure, disclose away, sir. Just, okay, yes. It was questions first, disclo disclosure second, as I understood it. Um, and I just wanted to disclose that I did have a discussion on this particular topic, uh, and uh, it was the presentation that Joe and Rick, uh, with the Touchmark representatives, <coughs> presented, um, and the uh, uh, conversation with Erica Beck did not include anything in addition to what um, was presented here this evening. In fact, what was presented here this evening was much more detailed than what I had uh, discussed with uh, Erica previously. Very good. Council, I am going to stop the hearing part of, uh, of, of tonight. Uh, is, that a, is that appropriate? Yeah. Okay, I, so I've now ended the hearing uh, on the city's behalf. Uh, now, uh, is it appropriate for me to move on to 49, sir? Uh, item 49. Mr. Mayor? Uh, 
I would move, uh, um, make a motion. Do, 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 we can that? we read this into that? Councilor? Oh, you're... got it, got it, no problem. Thank you. No Thank you, problem. Thank <laughs> you. Lauren, please. All right, motion authorizing the touch mark at All Saints Edition proposal and the issuance of any related permit based upon the consideration of all relevant factors and that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the proposal and the program includes all possible planning to minimize harm to the historic property resulting from such use. Diane, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, sir. Okay. Um, then is there anybody in the public uh, or who's here tonight who wanted to uh, speak to this item? Counselors. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I would <clears throat> make a motion authorizing the touch mark. Uh, at All Saints Edition proposal and the issuance of any related permit based upon the consideration of all relevant factors and that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the proposal and the program includes all possible planning and minimizing uh, to minimize harm to the historic property resulting from such use. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Rolfing has made a motion uh, and it has been seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Uh, discussion. Yes, Councillor uh, Kylie. I, I would think uh, that Touchmark has been very prudent, more than prudent in their approach, that they've listened and uh, they've gone back to the drawing board a number of times now and they've uh, uh, instituted the, the requests that have been uh, put before them. Um, <clears throat> and I it's, it's confusing, still confusing to me why a building on the west is viewed differently than a, the proposed building on the right. It seems like uh, a double standard to me, and uh, I very much su support this motion. Uh, yes, sir. I guess uh, I, I, I lived a few blocks away from there also uh, at that time period. Uh, on the west side of uh, touch of the uh, facility that is pr there now, it was a vacant lot. And it, right next to the vacant lot was just a, when you want to talk a dilapidated building, we, were, we are talking about as dilapidated as we could get. Um, the touch Mark, Lloyd, and the city came together and they changed the, that not only that that facility, that building, but they changed the, the direction of that neighborhood. And now we're seeing and hearing tonight uh, from those neighbors, from the people who live there, what that change has done and meant in their lives. Uh, I just feel that this is something that we should continue to support. A roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed seven to zero. Item 50. Motion to authorize the Sioux Falls City Attorney's Office to prepare written findings consistent with the above motion for discussion, review, and approval by the City Council. Any testimony on this, uh, Lori or Danny? Is this all about you? <laughs> okay. Uh, anything, Danny, to add to this? Okay. Uh, Council? Move for approval, Anderson. And second, Rolfing. It's been a motion to approve this item. It has been seconded. Uh, no discussion. A roll call vote, please. Do we need the do we need one order? Is there anybody in the uh, audience who wanted to speak to this item? Council? Uh, Mayor, motion to authorize the Sioux Falls City Attorney's Office to prepare written findings consistent with the above motion for discussion, review, and approval by the City Council. Second, Erickson. Thank you, Councilor Erickson, thank you. Uh, if there is no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed seven to zero. Council, any new business? Motion to adjourn, Erpenbach. There has been a motion to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Kylie, did you did you new have business? A, and I'm going to take business? the privilege to uh, wish my darling uh, wife Donna a uh, happy 25th wedding anniversary. And even though I've only spent 25 minutes with you today, <laughs> I greatly appreciate the past 25 years, and I look very much 
forward to the 25 years ahead of us. Mr. Mayor, happy birthday to Councillor Kiley on Thursday. It's his birthday as well, so it's a big week. Huge week. <laughs> Today's bigger. <laughs> on the record. <laughs> very good, very good. There was a motion to adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? I second. Seconded. Thing. Thank you so much. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned to falls. Make it a great, great night. <laughs>